session probably going file to Ruth Cockton of Ahn Shaw. Today, what we are hopefully addressing is the current model of production uh, presenting and co-presenting in the Abbey Theatre and recently a large number of actors and others working in the Irish Theatre wrote to the Minister for Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltic taking issue with the current approach of the Abbey Theatre in relation to the production pre presenting and co-presenting of work. It is understood that the letter stated that this approach has led to fewer in-house productions and has adversely affected the earnings of those working in the theatre. It raised issues in relation to the role of uh, the Abbey Theatre as Ireland's national theatre, the consistency of the Abbey's theatre's approach with government uh, national vision and uh, framework for culture and also the funding of the Abbey Theatre by the Arts Council. And given the importance of these issues, uh, the committee is keen to develop an understanding of the issues involved and to assist the committee in considering this matter, I am pleased to welcome, on behalf of the actors and others working in the Irish Theatre, Mr Declan Conlon and Ms Cleana Dukes, uh, from the Abbey Theatre, Dr Francis Ruan, Chairperson of the Theatre, and Niall Murray, who is Co-Director. Um, also from the Arts Council, or on behalf of the Arts Council, and Corla Lena, Ms Orla McBride, who is Director, and Ms Sheila uh, Pasha, uh, who is the chair. And apologies if I mispronounced that. I should have done my homework beforehand. Uh, before I ask people to address the meeting, I want to draw your attention to the fact by virtue of Section uh, 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons, or entity by name and, and in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. I also wish to advise that you... You, you, that the open statement and other documents you have submitted to the committee uh, may be published on the committee website after this meeting. Um, it, is, it would be our intention to do so. Um, members are reminded of the long-standing pract parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her uh, identifiable. Um, so. With that said, the only other thing before we start up is to remind uh, the, the, the witnesses and also members and uh, people in the public gallery, uh, could you please turn off your phone? It interferes with the <coughs> recording equipment, so if you want what you have to say to be heard legibly and clearly, um, please switch off your phones. Um, so, I'm going to ask one from each, each of the groups to make a presentation. Um, as I've said, the presentation summer, which we've given We've been given advanced copies of, and um, some of them are quite long. If you want to summarise them, they will be published on, in full on the committee website thereafter at the end of the meeting. And um, so you can uh, summarise or uh, try and uh, or, or re 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 repeat what, what's in it in full. Uh, the idea of today is to try and uh, elaborate on what's in, in, in those documents, help make the space, um, and try and address issues. Uh, into the future with at the Abbey as the Irish National Theatre. Uh, there will be questions when you're finished and I will take uh, questions from e each of the members in, in turn and I'll give opportunity for people to respond. Um, so I will first of all uh, ask um, our Deuce Barra, um, Declan Conlon, Con made a raw also our core. So Declan, Ma Tatu, Olaf. Good morning. 
Uh, if it's okay with the committee, I'm going to read the statement in full. Yes, Akahilak Agasiguinyushla. My name is Declan Conlon, and I have worked as a professional actor for almost 30 years. I appreciate the opportunity to represent the signatories of the letter of concern sent to Minister Madigan. The letter of concern with 312 signatories was sent to Minister Madigan, the Arts Council and the Board of the Abbey Theatre on the 7th of January. Since then, further signatories have signed to these concerns and it now totals 409. I would like to speak to the concerns raised in the letter and clarify some responses that have been received in relation to it. When the change in directorship at the Abbey Theatre occurred in late 2016, the theatre community excitedly welcomed the new directors. Their first short program introduced several independent companies to the stage of our national theatre by remounting very successful shows, a veritable best of. The thought at the time was that this was a good initiative as it would give our new directors time to settle into their roles and engage with the theatre community before revealing a new vision and model to the stakeholders. Now coming into the third year of their directorship, there is no evidence of this new vision or any understanding of the history, remit and responsibilities of our National Theatre. The programme continues to host a disproportionate level of revivals or remounts from the previous year's programme, co-productions or buy-in shows for presentation. The level of in-house productions has continued to decrease. In a city with only two major producing houses, a substantial reduction of in-house productions in one impacts greatly on the ecosystem of theatre employment overall. While a desire to bring in change is welcome, the unintended consequences of this changed model need to be addressed. In 2013 and 2014, the Abbey created a 1.6 million euro profit, which then covered planned and approved losses in the following two years for the lead up to and presentation of the 2016 centenary program. Although the new directorship's plans were endorsed for their financial viability, and we are told it has delivered modest surpluses and reintroduced the financial stability essential for the continuing operation of the theatre, the Abbey Theatre closed 2017 with an operating loss of nearly €47,000. We are not suggesting a return to the previous programming policies. However, these current strategies have had a detrimental effect on practitioners. To evolve, the Abbey and the industry need to forge a mutually beneficial way forward. The Abbey Theatre released a statement on the 7th of January in response to our letter. In it, they claimed an inherited 1.4 million deficit, whereas at the beginning of the new director's term, the Abbey had a surplus of 488,949 euro. On the 24th of May 2017, in the Village magazine, the directors were quoted as saying, there's no deficit at the moment. There may have been a small operating deficit last year, but the Abbey is not in deficit and they're not expecting one this year. By recklessly disseminating this incorrect information of a 1.4 million deficit, it caused reputational damage to the sector, reaffirming cliched notions that theatre is always loss-making. Four days later, the Abbey issued an updated statement clarifying that there was indeed no deficit. However, this incorrect information is still perpetuated in some media, although it has been retracted with an apology by the directors to their predecessor. In our letter, we had outlined that during the five and a half months between the closing of Jimmy's Hall on the 8th of September 2018 and the opening of the Country Girls on the 23rd of February 2019, there would be no Ireland-based actor on the stages of the Abbey directly contracted by them. In response, the Abbey obfuscation continued. They did not offer comparable numbers. It has recently come to our attention that the co-production of Tom Kilroy's Double Cross between the Lyric Theatre Belfast and the Abbey was contracted by the Lyric for the Belfast run and the Abbey for the Dublin run. So we are happy to clarify that instead of none in five and a half months, there were in fact three actors directly employed who featured on an Abbey stage in that time period. Three directly employed actors on the Abbey stages in five and a half months is unprecedented. The National Theatre has a responsibility toward the creative and financial health of the sector. In order to achieve financial sustainability for artists, the National Theatre must assist the independent co-producer to achieve Abbey agreed salaries, terms and conditions alongside artistic excellence. They must do this by investing in the salary structure. The Abbey is bound by house rates and subject to certain pay scales and employment rights. Independent companies are not. When they, are in the, when they are the lead produ producer in a co-production, this, current, this currently can result in lesser pay and lesser entitlements for the artists involved. 
Regarding a pay rate differential of up to 25%, as referred to in our letter, the Abbey states there is, quote, no basis over the last year in their employment data and budgets for this figure. At the time of writing the letter, the highest pay differential that had been brought to our attention was 25%. We have now been further informed. The cast of an Abbey co-production, while being paid acceptable rates in Dublin, suffered up to 36% reduction on the Abbey rate when the show played in London and a 67% reduction in subsistence. We would question the Abbey's data collection and are happy to provide these details to complete their records. We are told by the Abbey in their 7th of January statement that, quote, on average over the past six years we have self-produced 14 shows per annum on the Abbey and Peacock stages and on tour. However, the Abbey once again clarified itself in an updated statement on the 11th of January that in 2019 they will, quote, self-produce seven shows on the Abbey stages, thereby confirming a 50% decrease from their own claim. Communication is the problem here. Historical and institutional memory has been lost. Phone calls are not returned. Emails are not answered. A submission made in May 2017 to the new work department from an artist received an email acknowledging receipt of this submission in February of 2018. That's nine months later, by which time their idea had already been selected and programmed in a theater in the UK. What opportunities are we missing with this current system in place? The current administration has cut out a fundamental communication cord between artists and the theater, the casting department. Previously, this has been the sole point of contact with the Abbey for the theater community. The open auditions that used to take place annually or biannually have ceased. It is the remit of the National Theatre to build relationships with actors, to build a bank of talent and to nurture that talent. In the absence of a casting department, relationships are not formed. There is no continuity. Equally, the agents have no point of contact to discuss pay scales, terms and conditions and any and all other issues. The cutting of this department was, in our opinion, a remarkably naive action. This is the major part of the communication problem. This is the department that understands and mentors people's careers. The casting department should be reinstated with immediate effect. It is not only performers that have been affected. The number of freelance directors contracted by the Abbey has radically reduced. Under the current model, contracts for freelance directors are significantly down on previous years. In 2015, 11 freelance directors were contracted for productions on the Abbey and Peacock stages, as opposed to a projected four in 2019. That's nearly three times less employment opportunities at present for freelance directors. Writers are similarly cast adrift. An article in the Irish Times by the playwright Jimmy Murphy on the 15th of January outlined that, quote, confusion now abounds as to whether the National Theatre has a functioning literary department that engages with playwrights to discuss commissioning new works. Unquote. The Writers Guild of Ireland requested numbers on new commissioned works from the Abbey on the 16th of January to inform this presentation, but have yet to receive a response. Currently, the number of productions directed by Gray McLaren, including revivals, amounts to the majority of the Abbey's production output. A single artistic vision or voice is dominating self-produced Abbey shows. This is unprecedented and unbalanced. Previous artistic directors who were themselves professional directors did not direct such a large proportion of in-house shows. Combined with the policy to increase co-production, present buy-ins, and represent extant work, freelance opportunities become increasingly meager. The request made in our letter of concern was not to end these long-established practices of co-production or presentation, but simply to increase the proportion of self-produced shows, thereby generating further employment. We have to speak to the issue of double funding. The Abbey receives 50% of the entire Arts Council drama budget. It has recently co-produced with several of the largest Arts Council funded companies in the country, thereby benefit benefiting not only from its own funding, but from the funding brought in by that independent company. Many of these productions would most likely have been produced anyway, but at a different venue. An example is that Druid Theatre Company have a show every year as part of the Dublin Theatre Festival, usually hosted at the Gaiety. The Abbey has always historically produced a Dublin Theatre Festival show. Last year, for the first time, the Abbey did not produce a show for the festival, but instead hosted Druid's show. This not only houses our audience in one venue, but ultimately reduces choice for audiences by having one show on where there could be two in separate venues. 
It also effectively cuts employment for artists in half. Ultimately, double the money, half the shows. This detracts from the theatre ecology as a whole. Regarding the Abbey Theatre's presentation of the musical Come From Away for the Christmas period, the theatre stated, and I quote, Come From Away did not impinge on the Abbey's grant from the Arts Council, and it is expected to return a financial contribution that will be invested in the Abbey Theatre's programme for 2019 and beyond. Unquote. Contrast this with Neil Murray's interview in the Irish Times on the 1st of December, where he maintained, quote, with a good following wind, if it runs for two years on the West End, we would definitely recoup our initial costs. Questions abound. Was this show cost neutral? How was this show funded, if not by the Arts Council grant? Were the ticket prices for a bought-in commercial show subsidized by Arts Council money? Ireland-based agents put their clients forward at the beginning of March for consideration for this show, but received no response. The UK-based casting director informed us on the 5th of April that we will be going into final auditions as of tomorrow, so our process is nearly over. After pressure and questioning from actors and agents on Monday the 9th of April, the UK casting director contacted Ireland-based agents requesting to meet with their clients. No director attended these auditions and no Abbey representative was present and no one was cast from the Dublin auditions. The timescale of this lends substance to the perception that these brief and hurried auditions were nothing but a cynical exercise. Was this production predominantly cast prior to the Dublin auditions? This show garnered excellent reviews for media and audiences alike, and we stand by our statement in our letter that these excellent shows should be seen by Irish audiences in the correct venues, which are plentiful. In terms of our national theatre, why are these franchises being bought in instead of investing in making new work? Where is our chance to make shows like Come From Away or Room? We acknowledge the increase in the Abbey Theatre audiences and are delighted that more people are attending the national theatre. The introduction of the free first previews is an excellent initiative and has clearly demonstrated that the country does have an appetite for theatre and does want it subsidised. However, it would be prudent to note that in comparison to other theatres, for example Project Arts Centre, who receive a subsidy of €718,000 and attract an audience of 50,000, or Smock Alley Theatre, who receive a subsidy of €80,000 and attract an audience of 59,000, we can see that with far less subsidy, these venues are attracting excellent audiences and in comparable terms of bang for buck, much higher returns. So, is it all about bums on seats? These other venues need to create a somewhat commercially viable program to sustain themselves. There is less onus on the national theatre to do this, but more on it to nurture new playwrights, to challenge audiences with works that are complex and contradictory, like the audiences themselves, and like the world we all find ourselves living in, and to nurture and mentor all of our artists at all stages of their careers. We welcome new initiatives, such as the New Works Department but we need transparency in regard to how it works, how many commissions are progressed through it, if indeed any, and what are the criteria for selection. This initiative seems to be the only avenue for established playwrights as well as those emerging voices. Is it taking the place of the literary department? Is this the best method to deal with those writers who have built up bodies of work and already have a relationship with the National Theatre? We note with interest the appointment of a new dramaturg, but would urge clarification on all the job roles within the organization and the installation of a clear method of communication and feedback for artists. We would also urge clarity on the chosen co-productions. How are projects selected? What is the criteria for selecting and funding? How can a company apply to be considered? Does the company have to have a financial input or can it be artistic only? Let us be very clear. This is not about the current directors of the Abbey Theatre. This is about the current policy, strategy, pay scales and employment opportunities. This is about communication and engagement with the entire sector. This is about the role of our National Theatre, the passion and respect that we have for it and the vital direction we hope for in the future in order to evolve, sustain and enhance the ecology of theatre across the board. Our letter was written in order to call on the Abbey Board to define their strategy and to present a model which is cognizant of the many issues raised by the signatories. The Abbey Theatre's five-year plan from 2019 to 2023 states that the Abbey Theatre is artist-led and audience-focused. If that's true, 
then the voices of the 409 artists who signed the letter of concern need to be heard. Thank you very much. Um, and I think the voices now have been heard uh, once again. Hopefully they will be listened to in some ways, but now we have the opportunity to hear the other voices. So with that in mind, I will ask, um, let's see, what is it, Dr. Ruan Agus on Tusul Murray. Milis um, Kate Ardus, whoever's going ahead first. I start first. Well, I'd start first, thank Eric you very Lorker much. Um, so we welcome this opportunity here to discuss with your committee the current model of production and presenting and co-presenting in the Abbey Theatre. And this is obviously an evolving model, uh, it's, 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 and, and, and the sort of content of it evolves over a period of time, obviously how it, how it rolls out. Um, we received, and obviously what triggered this meeting, and as we've just heard, was the letter written by the 312 signatories in, in, in January. And immediately we put in train uh, arrangements to try to meet, to meet with the representatives. And we believe that there is a, a, a dialogue required and that that planned dialogue has been very much welcomed by everybody, I think, who's, is, as the appropriate way forward. In other words, we're sitting down with a lot of technical details in relation to the matters at hand. Um, for this reason, we're going to concentrate our engagement with the committee today on the specific areas that you've identified, uh, because we do not wish to preempt or create pre preconditions for what we hope will be a constructive and direct conversation on Friday and beyond. So that's our current situation. I want to brief members just briefly on the Abbey's history and our current governance and strategy, and then Neil Murray will talk about the more specific details in relation to our approach to production. Um, just to, to put in context, in, in 1904, W.B. Yeats and Lady Gregory established the Abbey Theatre, and their stated manifesto was to bring upon the stage the deeper emotions of Ireland. And I think many of you who have seen theatre in the Abbey in the last number of years have seen some very deep emotions of Ireland brought forward to, 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 to the audiences. In 1925, the Abbey became the first state-subsidised theatre in the English-speaking world, which is something I think we're all very proud of. And that state support has fostered great playwriting and great theatre making with the production of many memorable plays over, over 90 years. I think I was at the Abbey myself for the first time in 1965, and I have every programme from the Abbey Theatre back to 1968 when I started as a student at college. In 2008, a new governance was put in place following on discussions up to that period, establishing the Abbey as a company limited by guarantee. The recurrent funding comes from the Arts Council, which acts at arm's length from the department, and that was very much part of the decision at the time that there should be that, 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 that space. Given the scale of the funding um, and the Abbey's role as a national cultural institution, the theatre operates in full compliance with all the legislation overseeing those in receipt of significant financial aid from government. We see that as extremely important. That's, that's our second hat, which is the national cultural institution, and obviously the scale of funding requires that we do, we do that. Um, the Memorandum of Association establishes the key elements in our responsibilities, which include promoting the performance of dramatic arts to the highest standards, producing and co-producing plays, commissioning plays, and promoting appreciation of drama. In 2014, an independent review of the Abbey Theatre was commissioned by the Arts Council and conducted by international experts Bonner Keenly side. This recommended a reprioritization of the Abbey's activities to address a lack of touring and of community and education work, the under-involvement of visiting companies, and the underutilization of the Peacock Theatre as a space for artistic experimentation. In the period since, the Abbey has implemented the review's recommendations. In 2015, the board appointed Neil, and Neil Murray and Graham McLaren as its co-directors with effect from July 2016 and with effect for programming from January 2017. They were given a clear mandate to increase the activity levels of the Abbey while maintaining financial sustainability. So the slides five and six in the, in the pack will, will refer us to those, to those numbers. In November 2015, the publication of the Waking the Feminists uh, report showing the lack of gender balance in the, in the 2016 programme led the directors to prioritise the improving of gender balance as a key objective for the directors as soon as possible. So following my appointment in, in May 2017, we began the process of undertaking a strategic review culminating in our five-year strategy, which has been circulated to you. 
It was very much informed by the Bonner Keenly side report and feedback from the Arts Council, as well as developments of, in theatre internationally. So if you go onto the, the website of the National Theatre in London, you'll find their discussion of what a new works department is. This is a new way of, of actually creating, creating theatre that they and others are following. It also reflects the government's strong ambition for and commitment to the creative arts, which is a fantastic development in, in, in recent years. A desire to build a young, diverse audience, because that's crucial, and the Abbey did not have that. It was tending to have an older audience, and that has now changed dramatically. And the requirement to be financially stable. Sustainable, I should say. I just want to reference that for a moment, because it was mentioned in, 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 in passing. When the, when the, uh, at the end of 2016, there was indeed no... Um, there was no uh, accumulated deficit that was wrongly put out in, 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 in a, um, uh, an email, or sorry, in, in the statement from the Abbey. It was corrected as soon as it was brought to the Abbey's attention. What was this was accumulated losses, which were expressed as accumulated deficit, which as an economist I know is an entirely different thing. We absolutely regret the, 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 uh, the distress caused by that and to po apologise for it. But what it did mean was when the Abbey came in, our reserves were under 500,000, which for a theatre with a budget of around 10 million is a very, very low level of reserves, and accountants would not recommend that as being a sustainable way to continue. So it is absolutely the case that, that, that uh, there was no deficit, but it is the case that the level of reserves was not, is not, was not and still remains not at a level to support what we need to, we need to do. So our strategy, as we've, as we've put it in, which is set out, there's highlights of it on two, two, slides two and three in the pack, our strategy compels us to move forward in a spirit of collaboration, and that's what we have sought to do, and that's why the interaction with small and large companies throughout the country was seen as a positive thing. In other words, the Abbey's hermetically, not hermetically sealed roles, but it's, it's, it's being in, inside itself, uh, it, it was felt that this would be beneficial to have more um, involvement with smaller and larger companies through the country, and obviously that will, will develop uh, in different ways. At the heart is our robust commitment to the arts and the art form and to audiences throughout the country and internationally when the Abbey would tour as, as an important part of, 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 of government policy. Uh, the strategy is driven by our core values, which are excellence, inclusivity, diversity and equality. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, gender equality continues to be prioritised. From my perspective as the chair of the board, I have observed some very important achievements over the last two years, and they include the exceptional progress in increasing gender balance, and you'll see that that has, is, is recorded in the statistics on slide eight. The greater activity levels in the, in the Peacock Theatre, which everybody uh, openly welcomes and, and is, is delighted to see there. The presentation of new and overlooked voices, different kinds of companies being on the Abbey stage as opposed to um, uh, just getting that opportunity, which then allows them to go internationally with that reputation of having been in their national theatre. Increased numbers, and we have that on slide nine, and the changing profile of the audiences. And everybody, I think, who's been to the Abbey will have noticed just how different the audience mix has become and how much more socially uh, very wide-ranging it is, demographically wide-ranging it is, than it has been in the past. Um, and it has brought to the stage some very challenging social issues. And again, you know, we can talk to, talk to a whole range of those that have come up in the, last, in the past year, which are, are, I think, extremely relevant. And again, important to maintain annual expenditure in line with, 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 with annual income. But in celebrating those achievements, which have definitely been what the board set out to achieve, uh, the significant changes, and in any organisation significant changes, do have some in unintended consequences, and I'm delighted to see that the recognition that these are unintended consequences. Um, in the past four months, those unintended consequences have been under very active discussion between the Abbey Theatre and the Arts Council. They've been on the agenda and have been widely discussed to see how we, how we deal with them. As the recent theatre forum research illustrates, the working lives of artists are precarious and making a decent living as a freelancer is very hard. To make theatre, an openness to criticism as well as creativity is required. The Abbey regrets <clears throat> that some within our artistic community, in large numbers obviously, feel that our journey towards a more collaborative national theatre has contributed to their personal hardship. We commit to engaging with them and do what we can as the National Theatre to address their concerns and show leadership in strengthening and, rich and enriching Ireland's theatre sector. I hope that we can use the opportunity of Friday's meeting to commence a constructive dialogue towards this end. Thank you, Chairman. Neil. Oh, come on, get Neil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Francis. Um, Chair, TDs, Senators, colleagues. 
The approach adopted by the Abbey from 2017 onwards, in line with the strategy agreed with the Abbey Board, has been to develop a national theatre that, as Declan said, is artist-led and audience-focused. We believe our national theatre should be a people's theatre of the heart of Ireland's civic and social life, a theatre for all, regardless of where in the country you live or the amount of money in your pocket. But central to the history and legacy of the Abbey Theatre is its role as a producing theatre. This continues to be at the heart of our activity. 2018, for example, featured acclaimed productions of Marina Cars on Rathtree's Hill and Come On Home by Philip McMahon, featuring a wonderful performance by my colleague Declan here. And the run of Jimmy's Hall in 2018 features among the best attended shows in the Abbey's history. Alongside producing its own work, the Abbey Theatre has always co-produced and presented work. In 2016, for example, David Ireland's incendiary Cypress Avenue starring Stephen Ray was co-produced with the Royal Court Theatre in London. And in the same year, Frank McGuinness's Observe the Sons of Ulster Marching Towards the Somme was co-produced with Headlong Theatre, Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse Theatres in England, and Glasgow Citizens Theatre in Scotland. We believe in a national theatre that could be, also be a resource for the nation's theatre companies and makers. This has led to an increase in the number of co-productions and presentations, whilst retaining the Abbey's identity as a major producing theatre. The impact of opening the Abbey up to other companies and artists, whilst welcomed by many, and which was an important part of the transition process, did have the consequence of reducing the number of self-produced shows across 2017 and 2018, which we acknowledge clearly. We do acknowledge that some have been disadvantaged by that decision, while recognising that others who had previously struggled to find a home at the Abbey have benefited. The 2019 programme includes more self-produced work, while retaining the principle of an open, collaborative programme. There will be seven Abbey Theatre self-produced shows on the Abbey stage, of which three will tour in Ireland, the US and the UK. Our self-produced work will be on the Abbey stage for 31 weeks of the year in 2019, with co-produced work occupying 14 weeks and presented work occupying five weeks. A further two weeks are reserved for essential, essential maintenance. In 2019, the smaller Peacock stage, in the past, for financial reasons, dark for sustained periods, will have a full programme of work. This includes development periods for new shows by the Abbey and other artists, and initiatives such as the Abbey's 5x5 programme, whereby underrepresented communities are given the funding and space to work on the Peacock stage for a week. And the pilot of that programme in, in our first year of doing that, that included uh, the Pavi Point and Traveller Health, Health Care Project and Shadow Box Company for People with Intellectual Disabilities. It also includes the Young Curators Programme, a season of work for young people, selected by young people, as well as small-scale presentations by innovative, independent Irish companies and artists. Through these initiatives, we believe we can help unearth the new voices of Ireland, and in turn welcome new diverse audiences. Could the next thing or a Casey be currently living in direct provision? We will never know if we don't open our doors to these companies and organisations. This approach allows both Abbey and Peacock stages to operate all year round. The three-year average of 49 productions in 2017 to 2019 <laughs> compares with the corresponding average of 36 shows across the stages in 2014 and 2016. As has been already noted, noted audiences are responding positively to this approach. Our attendances are continued to grow and they, re they reached 127,500 at the Abbey Theatre in 2018, the highest since 2010. Crucially, for 56% of that audience, this was their first time at the Abbey. We believe in a national theatre where our artists are allowed to fail, but must be celebrated when they succeed. Our programme adjustment has led to a significant improvement in gender equality on the Abbey stages, which, like the other main Irish stages, have had a pronounced gender imbalance in the past. As well as the Abbey's self-produced programme investing directly in female talent, our invitation to independent companies in whose work we have also invested to present on the Abbey stages has contributed to the speed at which we have been able to improve gender balance and bring greater variety to our audiences. Against this positive outlook for the theatre, we take very seriously the concerns, the concerns raised by some in the theatre community, particularly around opportunities for Irish and Irish-based artists being directly employed by the Abbey. Let me give you a picture for 2019. Our self-produced programme will directly employ 85 actors over a total of 775 actor weeks. Of those 85 actors, the vast majority will be Irish and predominantly Irish-based. 
A further 66 Irish or Irish-based actors will be employed through co-production and paid directly at Abbey rates over a total of a further 342 actor weeks. Furthermore, through an association, presentation, readings and workshops, uh, one of the slides just breaks down the, uh, the, the explanations for that, um, we estimate a further 120 actors will engage in paid employment with the Abbey in 2019. Let me address the concerns expressed in relation to the potential underpayment for artists working at the Abbey, which we take incredibly seriously, and the co-production in association and presentation contracts issued potentially by a partner theatre company. In relation to co-production, we have been in discussion with the Arts Council on this matter in recent months. We have agreed to ensure that all future contracts will include a condition that any artist engaged in a co-production with the Abbey will be paid at the Abbey, the appropriate Abbey rate or higher, whether at the Abbey or outside of the Abbey. The issue of the Abbey determining pay rates for other companies presenting work at the Abbey is legally complex, and we would like to see this issue form part of the planned dialogue with our theatre colleagues over the coming weeks. We believe the Abbey Theatre should always be a fair-minded employer and collaborator whilst providing a good return for substantial public investment. We believe our programmes balance artistic ambition with financial prudence, support artistic development and diversity, while encouraging ever larger audiences to visit the Abbey Theatre. We welcome this opportunity to engage in positive dialogue with our colleagues from the Irish theatre sector and the Arts Council to ensure that our collective focus on making and presenting great theatre in ways that are fair to artists and attractive to audiences is at the heart of all we do. Thank you. So I invite... Uh, Ms. Orla McBride to present on behalf of the Arts Council. Um, my name is Orla McBride and I'm the Director of the Arts Council and I'm accompanied here today by the Chair of the Arts Council, Sheila Pradjka. Um, I want to thank uh, the Committee, the Deputy, the Senators for inviting us here today to discuss the current model of production, presenting and co-presenting at the Abbey Theatre. I will outline today the work of the Arts Council, our relationship with the Abbey Theatre and how we work to develop theatre and all of the arts in Ireland. The Arts Council's role is to support the development of the arts. We do this through a range of grants and awards towards the production and the creation of artistic work by supporting organisations, supporting individual artists and working in partnership with other agencies to develop the arts. The Arts Council has committed in its strategy, Making Great Art Work, to ensure that artists are supportive to make excellent work which is enjoyed and valued. We work across all our funding relationships and programmes to achieve this goal. In 2019, the Arts Council's overall budget is £75 million across a range of art forms, areas of arts practice, supports for individual artists, as well as partnerships and development initiatives. The Arts Council directly funds the Abbey Theatre, recognising its national cultural institution status, as well as the Abbey's distinctive position as a building-based national theatre. Under the 2005 memo and articles of association of the Abbey Theatre, the Minister for Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht directly appoints the Chair and three Directors of the Abbey Theatre. This process is now managed via the public appointments process, albeit the Abbey is not a state body. The Arts Council also has appointing authority by participating in a selection committee that appoints three further Directors. This selection committee comprises the Chair of the Arts Council, the Chair of the Abbey Theatre and an independent theatre practitioner. Additionally, there are staff appointees to the Board of Directors. The Board of the Abbey Theatre is responsible for the governance and the management of the organisation, including the artistic, strategic and financial aspects of the company. The Arts Council provides public funding to enable the organisation to carry out its work. The Abbey is audited by the Controller and Auditor General. In 2013, the Arts Council commissioned Bonner Keenly side to undertake an independent evaluation and analysis of the Abbey Theatre. The purpose of the review was to examine the business model of the Abbey Theatre in 2013 with the aim of identifying how available public money might, best secure, or might secure the best outcomes for the Abbey, the theatre community and the public and that the review should consider how the Abbey Theatre could deliver its mission in a way that was more efficient and effective and whether resources might be deployed to deliver more in terms of artistic and programming outputs. Following receipt of the report in April 2014, the Arts Council and the Abbey Theatre formed a working group, which met from May 2014 to work through many of the proposals within that report. 
Specifically, there was a focus on the operating model and the use of the Peacock Theatre as the development engine of the Abbey Theatre, increased production of new work prioritising Irish writing and Irish plays about Ireland, both commissioned and those by visiting companies, increased engagement and touring, legacy and leadership with talks, discourse being led by the Abbey, restructuring of the budgeting of the company's finances, restructuring the staffing models for productions to increase in-house capacity, and a new system for monitoring and evaluation. The working group comprised the following makeup. Chair, members of the Arts Council, the Director and other senior staff of the Arts Council, the Chair and members of the Board of the Abbey Theatre, the Director and other senior staff. Mm -hmm. Although the working group was established to oversee the re and review implementation of the findings and proposals of the bonner keenly side report, which were largely addressed under the direction of the previous Director, the group continued to meet on an ad hoc basis upon the engagement of the current artistic team, particularly in regard to the most recent bid for three-year funding. The Arts Council has provided three-year funding to the Abbey on three occasions, from 2006 to 2008, from 2011 to 2013, and from 2014 to 2016. Funding over a three-year period affords the Abbey and many other organisations a realistic time frame within which to plan and implement changes and has proven successful on a number of levels. It provides security of income which assists forward planning, both artistically and financially. As the periods 2011 to 13 and 14 to 2016 in particular were marked by reduced support from the Arts Council due to the economic downturn and its impact upon government funding, this forward funding facility became ever more important. In 2015, a three-year funding agreement was extended by one year to include 2017. This was sought in order to assist in the smooth transition to the current leadership team within the Abbey. In 2017, the Arts Council entered into discussions with the Abbey Theatre on a new three-year funding agreement. The Abbey was at that time also developing a new artistic vision, mission and programme. In February 2017, the Council delayed agreeing a three-year funding uh, envelope as it required a more comprehensive and detailed application from the Abbey Theatre. As a result, the Arts Council only made a one-year funding commitment in September 2017 to the Abbey Theatre for 2018 of £7 million, which included 200000 towards touring, and sought further information and detail regarding its artistic vision and strategy, its overall programme and models of production and presentation before it would make an offer for subsequent years. The Arts Council made a further offer in October 2018 of funding to the Abbey Theatre for 2019 and 20, with a series of conditions attaching. These conditions specifically focused on the Abbey providing clarity in relation to the nature of the production and presenting models being programmed, the impact on the quality employment opportunities for actors and creatives, in particular through an increased output of Abbey-owned productions, and the level of remuneration across all models of production at the Abbey. The Council agreed to withhold 300,000 of the funding proposed for 2019 until these areas were addressed. The Council met with the Board and the Executive of the Abbey in November and December of 2018 with a further meeting to take place following the Council's plenary meeting in February of this year. The previous model at the Abbey saw six equally budgeted Abbey productions and one international visiting production coupled with a, fluctua a fluctuating number of Peacock shows. Increased programming of the Peacock occurred laterally and was dependent on funds being generated from box office surplus in the Abbey. The new model of production structure is varied. The Abbey's own productions are less, but a high number of national and international co-productions and presentations afford the programme a much increased output. Presentations and co-productions aim to foster genuine and ongoing relationships between individual theatre artists, independent theatre companies, festivals and the National Theatre. They provide audiences with the opportunity to see a greater variety of work on the Abbey stages. The role of the National Theatre is to be a leader in presenting and producing work that inspires and engages, as well as supporting the theatre community and sustaining the sector with exemplary employment opportunities. The responsibility for the artistic and the strategic direction of the Abbey Theatre rests with the board of the Abbey Theatre. The Arts Council cannot and does not wish to dictate the artistic programme of the Abbey Theatre. However, it does, through its funding relationship and art form policies, attend to overarching concerns such as the fair remuneration of artists, quality employment opportunities for actors and creatives, as well as the balance between Abbey-owned productions and other independent uh, productions, be they funded by the Arts Council or not. 
The current model, as evidenced by the recent letter from three theatre practitioners to the Minister, as well as the Arts Council's own articulated concerns, is now, two years into its realisation, impacting on the broader theatre ecology with unintended consequences. A review of the impact of this model, as well as a rebalancing, is now required. The Arts Council continues to work with the Abbey and the theatre sector to ensure that the very best outcomes can be achieved for practitioners and for audiences. Thank you. Um, if you can be brief, as brief as possible, I will allow people to come back in again if we have time at the end. So kind of there, there, there's three different groups, three distinct presentations. Um, so uh, kind of, it, it, we can bounce back and forth if, if we have the time. Um, Chair, can I say from the outset that uh, the long-term systematic underfunding of the arts is at the core of where we find ourselves following the publication of the letter from the open letter to the Minister for Culture from over 300 artists and now over 400. Uh, we can't ignore the impact of prolonged underinvestment as we assess why that model uh, has been chosen at the Abbey and pursued by the board and, der and the directors. <coughs> I also want to acknowledge the positive work undertaken by the directors in terms of public engagement and, um, and audience development. Um, however, a direction that leads to wage depression of up to 25% is, uh, whether accidental or otherwise, is unacceptable. Um, every person at our National Theatre should be afforded the highest industry pay scales um, that reflect the stature and the importance of the National Theatre and that set the bar for the wider industry. Um, and so I'm extremely alarmed about the 54% reduction in the number of actors directly employed by the Abbey Theatre and the move away from original works that lead to a smaller pool of theatre work for all. And in all of this, um, we shouldn't forget that artists, those not on a salary, uh, continue to be left devastated by austerity. And according to the CSO data, uh, artists now earn 3.5 percent less than they did in 2013. Those on salaries did take a hit, but the work of, uh, for self-employed people disappeared, along with the Arts Council budget, which from 2008 at 82 million reduced to 56 million in 2014. Um, so, at this point in the uh, gradually improving funding circumstances, the Abbey Theatre and other well-funded organisations have to lead the way in terms of pay and, and conditions um, for people who aren't on a salary. Um, the Arts Council fund theatre more than any other art form. Uh, the Abbey Theatre received more than, that, more than half of that budget line. So I have three initial questions for the Abbey Theatre. Um, will the theatre commit to try harder and to guarantee that it will lead by example before the year is out. My understanding is the Abbey Theatre programme is booked from now until the end of the summer. What kind of measures can the Abbey take action on immediately? And what will have to be put on the long finger given commitments that will be made in that programme this year? Okay. Then I go now on Abbey Massey. I guess I just have one question. Um, your, your reference to the leading bags, could you just go through the three separate issues you want just to mention yes. again, please? Yeah. Will you try harder? Will you guarantee uh, that you will lead by example in terms of paying conditions okay. before the year is out? And what immediate action can be taken? And what will have to be put on the long finger given commitments that would be made in terms of the programme this year? Before I hand over to, to, to Neil Murray, I mean, I think we are very clear on the fact that as far as co-produced shows, it's entirely clear now that immediately starting in January and agreed with the Arts Council some time back, the paying conditions of people in co-produced shows with the Abbey Theatre uh, will be exactly the same as the Abbey rates. So when you say how soon we will do that, that's being done immediately and is already in, in, in train. 
I ask Neil to talk about the others, which is a more complicated issue because of, of legal requirements in relation to both competition law and labour law. Um, it's an issue of that. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, but it's also, I think, I mean, I just want to say up, up front, it's great to have this opportunity to have this discussion. Um, and the Graham McLaren and I, when we came into the Abbey, um, there was absolutely uh, a hunger, um, I think, for, for change and for, uh, for a more open uh, philosophy um, at the Abbey in terms of its relationship with artists and companies who had previously uh, perhaps uh, not had opportunities there. Um, what was never the intention was to, to make the Abbey a non-self-producing organization. And as we've already said, in 2019, that number is up to seven shows again, which is pretty much in line with what the Abbey has, has, has been doing over the past certainly seven or eight years prior to, to Graham and I taking over. Um, what I would also say is that the, the co-productions are there, they, they come from a, an artistic and a creative impulse. They come from meetings with organizations uh, who approach us with ideas to, to tell important stories on the national stage. Um, so for example, we're about to do the, the, the first co-production in 2019 is, is with Theatre Club. Um, and what I think is, is sometimes in danger of being called double funded, we see as an enhancement. An organization can come to the Abbey with a relatively small amount of money for a, for a show and we, what we then do is sit down with them and say, what, how much do you need to make this show the way you really want to make it? And that includes absolutely paying them at the rate they should be paid at, as if they are working for the Abbey Theatre. So we then add a sum of money to that, which enhances that budget, which means that Theatre Club get to make a show on the main stage of the Abbey Theatre in a way that they couldn't have done elsewhere. They could have made that show, but with less resource, and potentially with, um, uh, uh, not able to, to pay at the rate they're able to do because of, uh, because of what the Abbey has given them. So our aim is to absolutely step up the level of self-produced work. That's, that's in, in, it's in our bones, it's what we want to do as theatre makers. But we do want to keep the positive sense of collaboration and openness at, at the Abbey coming. So the, the 2019 programme is, is effectively in place with, with those seven self-produced shows there and a couple of co-productions and some still to be determined through our discussions with the Arts Council. And 2020, obviously, as we start to look forward and on, the long, on the longer fingers, you put it, you know, we will be in discussion with our colleagues starting um, this week um, to, to hopefully take advantage of the extraordinary talent that's in Ireland and the, ex and the extraordinary potential opportunity that's here. And, and the Abbey wants to be part of that. The Abbey wants to be making positive engagement with the community. And we've been doing that with a lot of people who have had access to the Abbey who previously haven't. We clearly ha have to make redress with people who are dissatisfied with that model. So we are, we, are, we are listening and we want to talk and we want to engage. I just want to talk about the casting. Like the National Theatre is expected to punch way above its weight in terms of original works that receive international, critical and commercial success. Um, I'm aware of the new playwright, very aware of the new playwright program uh, in terms of its importance to develop the writer and not just to play. Mm. Um, and we have the Peacock described as the engine room of our theatre. I've seen plays on the Peacock recently that could and should be on the main stage of the Abbey. Um, do you accept that Irish theatre won't survive or that we won't have another Brian Freel? Uh, with the policy of old revivals, of recent reruns, and the buying in of international productions? Uh, but, well, we, that isn't what we're doing. The, you know, the, the 2019 programme has three new plays on the Abbey stage. So, yes, there are, there are absolutely room for revivals and room for other presentations, but we're also making new theatre. Um, and we, that's what happened in, in 2018 as well. Um, there were new productions in the Peacock, Porcelain, Come On Home, as well as new productions on the Abbey stage. And as I say, in 2019, there are immediately there are three new plays, uh, commissioned plays by the Abbey on the Abbey stage, or, or by Irish writers. Sheila Praska and Orla McBride, you're very welcome back to the Committee on Culture. Um, what do you think it means to the Abbey Theatre when the Arts Council withhold 300,000? Does the Abbey immediately feel the impact of that, or? Will the Abbey feel the impact as part of a lump sum of a couple of million euros at some point of the year? Um, the, the reason we chose that figure 
was that um, at that point in the planning for 2019, we didn't want to unbalance or disturb uh, the viability of the Abbey to programme and to make commitments and to sign contracts. But we wanted to choose a figure that was large enough to indicate um, our concern. Um, I think it might be no harm at this point to make um, uh, emphasise the fact that the increased payment, the proper payment to artists and all of the people who work in the Abbey will come out of the Abbey budget. Independent production companies will not be topping up the, um, the, 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 the payment. That's number one. And number two, the independent production companies and the Abbey will have a much more stringent reporting relationship with the Arts Council so that we can ensure that there isn't, in fact, can we talk about that? Undue double funding. As well as guaranteeing the rights of artists, whether mm. directly or indirectly employed by the Abbey, what other conditions did the Arts Council place on the Abbey Theatre? You can actually read it out <laughs> so that I don't. Uh... Um, yes, yeah, so it was looking at the employment opportunities available to actors and creatives, um, particularly looking at increased output of the Abbey's own productions. Um, um, and then particularly looking at the remuneration of artists um, through the other models of production, be they presentation or be they co-production. Um, and then there were others in relation to um, uh, public engagement and audience development. What, uh, like if I wasn't elected to public office with a very good wage and I was still playing music uh, full time, I'd almost certainly not be living in Ireland. Um, I look at my friends who make a living in the arts with admiration and respect. Mm. Sean Dunn asked a group of politicians in Leinster House recently, if we can't afford to live here in this country, does Ireland still get to claim our legacy? What role can the Arts Council, my instinct is that the Arts Council can't set rights, uh, but if something is funded by the Arts Council, can we not ensure that the people, that people are well paid and that the rates set by equity or the Musicians Union if and when they set rates or Visual Artists Ireland uh, that those rates are imposed by the Arts Council with an iron fist? We do in the past, um, where when we're assessing applications, we feel that the artist is not getting paid enough. Um, we've withheld money, we've conditioned funding, particularly in the area of the visual arts. Um, so yes, we do. Uh, we're currently at the moment developing a, a policy, a stated policy, because you're absolutely right, we cannot um, set pay rates for artists, um, but we can work with resource organisations like Theatre Forum, like Visual Artists Ireland, like Dance Ireland, to ensure that they are very clear in terms of the optimum pay rates for artists. Equity, obviously, in the theatre um, sector, it is, it is much, heavily, much more heavily unionised than in other sectors, um, so, so in a way equity is there and serves that purpose, but in other art forms it's not so easy, particularly in an area such as the visual arts, uh, where you have an individual artist um, who, is, who is trying to get their work um, seen either in exhibition or in, in um, group shows, so it's very, we work very closely with Visual Artists Ireland to ensure that those artists are paid properly um, for both exhibition um, fees and, and often we would um, condition funding to different organisations, galleries, etc. to ensure that happens where it has been brought to our attention that artists are not paid properly. Chair, can I ask one question? One more. Um, one of the problems I've experienced in proposing budget alternatives is the fact that economic impact reports on heritage, audiovisual, the arts come from different years and with the exception of the audiovisual <coughs> sector, uh, these reports are, are out of date. Um, under part nine of the Arts Act, the Arts Council have a general function to fur furnish advice to the Minister um, whenever the Council consider that appropriate. Do you accept that the Arts Council have fallen short in the last eight or nine years in terms of developing the living and working conditions report or the economic impact report um, and how can we expect and can we expect more research that would enable the minister to approach the department of finance in budget 2020 um, 
Yes, I mean, the last Living and Working Conditions of Artists report that we did was, was back before 2008. That report at that time cost €100,000. So during the years that our funding was reducing, we had to make decisions, and the decision was that we couldn't possibly invest that kind of public monies in uh, commissioning of reports, when actually we know what we know, which is that, that artists are, are not well paid and, and, and do struggle to make a living. Um, to spend €100,000 to be told what we knew um, and what we know, uh, we didn't think that that was appropriate at the time. Economic impact studies, again, the last one we did was in 2012, and that was, again, for financial reasons that we just didn't, um, we didn't feel it appropriate to, to, to use um, our, our reducing resources on impact studies. But certainly in relation to the theatre um, sector and the theatre community, um, we have, um, last week at a council me uh, meeting, discussed looking at the impact of um, the, the, the current model of production at the Abbey Theatre and the impact that that's having on the full arts and theatre ecology um, and how we will work with the sector to ensure that we can address the concerns that are being raised. If I don't get a chance to come back in, I just want to wish you all the very best on Friday. Um, we all respect that there's a lot riding on the outcome. Okay, um, I'm going to ask Senator Mary Louise Donald, uh, to ask a number of questions. And again, it's uh, whichever. Thank you very much and, uh, for your presentations, which were all very varied, and I'm a, bit, a tiny bit confused. So I just have a few questions. And um, first thing I'd like to say is, is that the Health Committee yesterday, I'm not on the Health Committee, but I was at it, and they were arguing about uh, the fact that they were, we were overspending by 1.7 thousand million on a hole in the ground. And I was delighted to be able to tell them, like pantomime villain, you know, we're, oh, we were all aghast with this because nobody can find out how the money is being spent, that we would never hear that kind of money in here in arts, culture, in the island and the Wales. We'd never see it. We wouldn't be able to even say it. Also, to point out that 75% of actors have no health insurance. And that is kind of the core of uh, what we're talking about here, a livable wage. I'd also say the same about nurses. Nurses can't afford to live in this country, neither can radiographers or occupational therapists. So I think this place has gone half mad. But besides that, can I just come back to points I want to ask each one of you? Um, Mr. Conlon, I, I thought that your paper was excellent, and I read it um, earlier. And I think you, you've caught it in one, what really needs to be discussed on Friday outside this committee and what do, the answers to which are communication, the breakdown of communication, the no casting department, which I think is ridiculous, the, the, the no open auditions, the maybe, or the settled before the outcome, you know, um, the freelance directors, the decrease in writers, the decrease in directors. I, I, I'm, I'm, are these all going to be sorted, Mr. Murray, um, on, on, because it makes very, it was like a very good soliloquy, you know, it was a, from the heart, it was extremely factual, and you were on the money if you, um, as to what is going on, and why 407 actors um, signed this, because we wouldn't do it easily. Um, uh, and the difference between audience growth, bums on seats, and artistic excellence, you know, I... I think that made brilliant points throughout your paper, and I just wanted to ask, Mr. Just generally, are those going? Because you, you tell us that one of them is going to be have agreed to ensure that all future contracts will include a condition that any artist engaged in a co-production with the Abbey will be paid at the appropriate Abbey rate or higher. So that is answered there. But are the other areas? So I, I, I'll go on to my second question, and then you can come back to that. Um, um, Orla, for the director of the um, Arts Council. Do you think the Abbey is doing its job? Um, uh, what would you recommend? Uh, do you agree with the new strategies? Because you say there are unintended consequences and a rebalancing is now required. So could you tell me what you, what you mean by that? How a rebalancing is now required and what that rebalancing is? Um, also, um, Ms. Mrs. Ruan, um, Bonner Keelan side, and most of they cost, much of that report cost. Um, and did it tell you anything that you didn't already know? You know, this big report that, uh, well, that was initiated. Um, 
And also, you say here, which I think is extraordinary, to make theatre an openness to criticism as much as creativity is required. The Abbey regrets that some of our artistic community feel our journey, well, more than some, uh, towards a more collaborative national theatre has contributed to their hardship. So, could you just maybe explain that and how you intend to um, oversee that, or oversee that never happening again? Can I just ask a general opinion here of Mr. Murray, who's new? And I loved, I've been at the Abbey since I was five years of age as an audience member. Do you think there's something wrong with us that we have no Abbey training school? That we've lost that? And that sometimes I go to plays, now this is me on a rant, and somebody comes on the stage who I know shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be there. No, shouldn't be there because the training has not been. I'm not talking about the training where people train from a child, you know, from being a young. You have to, a young actor has to get a chance. Of course. Not talking about that. I'm talking about there's something wrong with a national theatre that subscribes to everything that Yeats subscribed to, that has produced international, world-class actors, some of them sitting opposite me, world-class directors, world-class playwrights and has no training school. There's, and I don't know whether that you, have, you have that in mind, because I don't know whether that's thought about or, or that, because that would be a nurturing, that is your 300,000 or your 400,000 nurturing. And um, so I, maybe I've, I've asked too many questions because they're all really intertwined. And I'm gonna be very honest with you. The actors in, in the gallery know more about this than me and the actors and the practitioners across from me and the Arts Council. And I just wanna know that on Friday we will come out because it is the one of the things, if I was to say, where am I going to find the truth now? I am not gonna to go to the media. And I'm, I'm not gonna to go to politicians. I sit in the Senate, so we're in legislators. But I would go to the theatre because Mark Patrick Hederman was in here last week and he said that the artists, that we have forgotten that artists are the greatest cardiograph of the present and the prognosis of the future. That they will track, the, the writer, the artist, the practitioner will track where a country is and what a country is, or a musician, or a visual artist, far faster than any politician. So he, had a, he was talking about it philosophically, but if we lose that, and we lose the great young talent and we use the passion, we lose the passion to go into the work, to go into these areas of artistry. Because we don't, we don't treat them right internally as well as externally and we don't give them enough money, we are in trouble. But maybe you'd ask, answer the training, maybe you'd answer the Bonner and maybe, maybe Mr. Collin would like to just mention what he felt about writing that and whether he felt any of these things are going to be answered because I think you you, you coordinated very well, and maybe the Arts Council would answer why they say things like the unintended consequences. <laughs> you sound like a politician, Ms. McBride. Rebalancing now required. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, Reduce Parla, Neil. I'll, I'll, I'll address the training one first. Um, it would now be unusual for, for theatre companies anywhere in the world to have their own training. What we have in Dublin, and we're incredibly lucky, is we have the LEA. The LEAR is a training school in Dublin, which is churning out really brilliant young actors, particularly young actors, but also actors through the National Theatre. I'm not talking about LEAR. I know that. I'm no, asking what your opinion is about a training school in the National Theatre I think called the would, Abbey. I think it would be inappropriate. I think it, it should happen outside of the National Theatre, and it's happening brilliant, brilliantly in Dublin at the LEAR, and the National Theatre and other theatres are benefiting from that. So the production of Asking For It that was just on our stage, I think had eight recent graduates from that school. That's what, and they have the expertise, the time, the funding to properly train young people in a brilliant way. And I, I, I take my hat off to the LEA as well as the Gaiety School of Acting and the Trinity as well. But the LEA particularly are at the top of their game, I think, and are producing really wonderful young actors, which the Abbey are benefiting from, as indeed are other companies in Ireland. Yes. Questions, I, think, I disagree with that, but then that's my own opinion. I just I don't disagree with the Lear, but I disagree that the national theatre that we're all making great philosophical statements about, I'm coming down with philosophical statements, um, has no training. How, where's your ethos then? How, how do you, oh, this is a private conversation <laughs> for another day. We'll have, we'll have a drink what happens your ethos <laughs> if it starts coming in from the carnivals from afar? You know? Where's your ethos? 
Can we ask Sheila or anyway. whichever it's my question asked for the Arts Council? I'm, I'm, I became an old age pension. I'm 66. I'll say what I like now. I'd be delighted to further converse on it as well. Please don't print them <laughs> <laughs> on the black screen. Uh, yes, yeah, so Chair, I might take the question in relation to rebalancing and unintended consequences. Um, and the Bonner Keenly side was about looking at and diversifying the production model. So it was about trying to open up the Abbey, um, particularly looking at animating the Peacock stage. And that has happened. Um, but we believe now, and I think um, it's very clear that the effect on the artist, the effect also on other venues around the city and around the, 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 the country, that, um, that in reshaping its production model, that the Abbey has probably, uh, it's become a very radical shift in a very short period of time, and it has affected the lives of individual artists, and it has affected the theatre sector. Um, I don't believe it was never intended, mm -hmm. and I think we need to stand back now and together as a sector we need to, to, to work together and collaborate and look at how we can, can, can rebalance it in a way. Um, so that's what I mean by rebalancing and unintended consequences. Rebalance it where? Mm -hmm. Rebalance it so that the concern is that there are less Abbey owned productions now. I mean, Neil has, has spoken to that, um, and we had concerns as the, as the Arts Council that there were less and less Abbey owned productions, that they were employing less and less actors and creatives themselves because more work was being brought into the Abbey Theatre. It's like, like the actors, I mean, this is back. It was produced Did, outside. Do you see any link to that with the training? Do you see any link? I mean, nobody wants to talk about training anymore because everybody can do it like that. But, but, but do you see any link to what I'm saying about having its own house? I think that probably its own training the house. session might be better equipped, but I think it hasn't had its own training house in many, many years. Um, but this, what we're talking about now, is something that has emerged in the last two years as, as the new model is bedding down. So. I, I can't. I, I don't think it necessarily is because there isn't a training house. No, I'm not saying theater. that. I'm saying, do you see a link to what you're saying? Not really. Not with the training house, no. You don't. No. Okay. Declan or Claire, they just want to respond to. But you're effectively you... saying it's just become a receiving house. Mm. It, it needs to. Yeah, it needs to. And I said, forgot what it was. It's, it's, its whole point of ethos was. Is that what you're saying? No, not not that it has effectively just become a receiving house. It's probably it has it is producing less of its own productions than it had in the past. Right. That's just another way of saying what I've said. We, we can come back to it with time at the end. So, no if I may, just briefly, thank you. Um, I think that notion of a training school might be served by what we were discussing. By the way, this, this letter was written by Maureen Madlin and Cleana Dukes with very small input from me, so I can't take credit for it. I did, <laughs> just delivered it. Um, but I, I think the, the relationship that we mentioned in the letter of the casting department, the nurturing of young talent, wherever they're trained, if they're trained in the Lear or they're trained in the Gaiety School of Acting, at the moment there is a huge problem because there is no connection between people coming out of drama schools and the National Theatre. Mm. You, the only way you can have access to the National Theatre now, it seems, is by forming a company. And it's very odd, this notion, because the theatre, the arts funding in Ireland has, since the Abbey had its own company, which is a very long time ago, mm. it suited, the change model then was that everybody was going to be a freelancer. Mm. Nobody was going to have any security of tenure in the arts, you're all freelancers. And the, and, the, and the community adapted to that over the years. What we have now is a situation where if you're a freelancer, the, the, the system has changed now recently with this new, this new direction for the Abbey Theatre, and no artist was consulted, as far as I'm aware, about this new direction. This was something that was, was discussed, obviously, by the Board of the Arts Council and uh, by the Board of the Abbey and the Arts Council without any consultation with any of the 409 people who have written this letter. But the, the outcome of this is that freelancers are now being, being deprived, in a way, of work in the Abbey because they're freelancers. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot, if, you're not a member of, if you're not a company, if you don't set up a small company and you're not a member of a small company, you don't have access to the Abbey Theatre. The only way we used to have access was when there was a variety of independent freelance directors employed mm -hmm. by the Abbey Theatre who then employed a, a wide variety of individual freelance actors because that's how the net was spread a wide variety of people or a wider variety of people were employed. That has shut down completely at the moment. Um, 
And, and I think the, another side effect of that is that we have a very limited creative vision as a result. You have, and I said this in, in the letter, we said this in the letter, on the main stage of the National Theatre at the moment, we have one man directing the major funded productions, one vision. The, and, and, I'm, and on all of the, the, the productions that have come back for extensive runs, it's also very difficult as well, by the way, two of the plays that were mentioned, uh, Come On Home, which I was very pleased to be a part of, and Raftery's Hill. Raftery's Hill had ten performances. Ten performances. Less than two weeks. Well, it was less than two weeks. Three weeks, 16. Well, it was over three weeks. Yeah, well, uh, ours was three weeks. No, no. These, no, uh, no. Jimmy's Raftery's Hall. Hill was over three weeks, sorry. Well, it was under three weeks. Four weeks. No, coming home was three weeks. Well, we can. Uh, oh, coming home, maybe, maybe, or maybe coming home was four weeks. But the point is, that the productions that have all been directed by Graham have all come back for extended runs, for three months, four months, uh, and and it's not just. My complaint is not just about. It's that's a particular type of work as well. That's one. That's a separate question. Yes. There's a lack of. There's a lack of a, a spread of artistic vision mm. because there are too few freelance, independent voices being employed in the theatre. And, and I don't understand why people who have been spending 30 odd, 40, 20 years in this business aren't consulted by the board of, or the people who run the Abbey Theatre about potential uh, shows. You know, if you're not in a company, as I say, if you're not a member of a company, when you're in a company, by the way, the cast for that company is the members of that company. That's who gets cast. So there is no freelance, there is no uh, uh, open auditions for those. That company has its own core members and they're cast in that, so there are no auditions for those. But, but uh, if I could just ask about the casting department, will it be reinstated? But that would be my, but I was asking you those questions. Are you, are you confident that that might happen through the chair? Sorry. I can't tell you whether the casting department will be reinstated. He was about to. Well, he can't answer it because I, I, the people who can answer it are in front of you. No, but are you confident? Are you, I mean, I, I was you were having this meeting on Friday with all these things that you spoke about, communication, open uh, auditions, uh, uh, freelance uh, directors, writers. I maybe didn't get the answer of, uh, on Friday. Um, I was trying to move on because there's another member after coming and there's three right, But this other member is not a member of the committee chair. But it's kind of a... a and has a tendency to arrive in late uh, in the not, evening. Not, not, not as another himself. pantomime villain. Um, the Senator Maura Hopkins has sat through all, all of what... <laughs> Politics doesn't have Senator. to be a doll, you know. <laughs> Um, Maura Hopkins has sat through all of the uh, meeting thus far, well, so... answered my question. Um, yes, and, <laughs> and, and maybe because of Friday, we won't get all of the answers. Um, can I take Senator Hopkins and kind of we can come back because some of the issues... Some of these answers to some of these statements and questions that have been made do need to be answered during the course this afternoon, Chair. No, I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm not shutting you down because you. some I have down for question myself, so I will repeat some of what others have said, which will give everybody the opportunity to put on the record of the house and kind of before we close here kind of their answers and uh, we, we will be leaving you at some stage to follow on the debate or the conversations uh, on friday uh, but i'm not closing down any debate i'm just moving along and come back again if needs be to if we have time so senator hopkins thank, thank you chair um, thank you all of you for your presentations um, just have a number of questions and I'll stick to them. Um, just in respect of the um, Arts Council, Orla McBride, your, your presentation. Um, you have mentioned, uh, I suppose, the, a report that was commissioned in 2013 and has outlined specific recommendations. Um, you've then mentioned that the group has continued on an ad hoc basis. Why, have, why are we at this point then if these recommendations in terms of the operating model, um, increased production of new work, both commissioned and those by visiting companies, a system for monitoring and evaluation, why are we, why are we at a place where 300,000 has been withheld at the present time because 
there are there there appear to be issues in terms of what you have outlined um, with regard to the nature of the production, presenting models being programmed, the impact on quality employment opportunities for actors and creatives. So I suppose the question is, what, why are we at this place if this working group and if, as you said at the outset, um, the recommendations were largely addressed? Um, that's my first question. Um, just the key points that are, are coming to me from the presentations today, obviously we are aware a lot from the media coverage in terms of the fair um, re remuneration of artists, quality employment opportunities and the runs of productions being shorter. There are the three, I suppose, key points. Um, how, you have mentioned that um, one of them is being addressed or is in the process of being addressed with regard to um, uh, we've agreed that all future contracts will include a condition that any artists engaged in a co-production with the Abbey will be paid at the appropriate rate or higher um, and obviously you know the discussion previous to this is that you know artists um, aren't um, being paid enough really to, to be able to manage um, long term. Um, how, how do you expect, I suppose from, from the Abbey Theatre point of view, those three issues will be addressed in terms of um, the fair remuneration which you've alluded to, but quality employment opportunities um, and as Declan has mentioned, the runs of, of productions being shorter is my um, second question and the third question really I suppose is an issue that has already been raised with regard to those structures that communication and maybe that goes back to my first point obviously there's a meeting on Friday um, but what, what structures are planned to be put in place to ensure that we, we, we don't arrive at this situation again that there is you know there's there's um, proper um, communication structures um, that I suppose issues don't escalate to the point that they're at where 409 people have raised concerns. Um, I suppose I just want to also state um, just in terms of funding, obviously we know over the past number of years there have been challenges with regard to budgets. Um, I think it is important to point out though that the budget for arts and culture um, has increased by 14% um, on 2018. It has increased by 22 million to almost 190 million. Um, and obviously that's money, government money, um, that we need to ensure that there is accountability and that there are proper structures in place. Um, so I, I suppose I would appreciate if those three questions could be answered. Thank you. Uh, we'll also take some of those specific questions to the Arts Council. Yeah, I can take the one, the, the, the question um, specifically in relation to why are we at this point, um, given that Bonner Keeley side was back in 2013, 2014. Um, there was, there was a previous director in place back then um, and largely much of the, the recommendations from the Bonner Keeley side report were being attended to. Um, the reason we're at the point now where the Arts Council has withheld 300,000 um, is because we have been in negotiations with the Abbey in relation to a new three-year funding deal. We should have made a funding offer to the Abbey back in 2017 for 18, 19 and 20. Back in 2017, the Abbey wasn't ready um, to provide us with the kind of strategy and vision that would allow us to have made a three-year funding um, agreement with them. So we didn't. We made a one-year funding agreement, um, and then we revisited it again when they provided further information to us. And when they provided the further information to us um, late last year to allow us to make a decision for 19 and 20, um, 
we felt that there were issues there and areas of concern for the Arts Council, which I've clearly articulated, and it was at that point that we withheld 300,000 so we could enter into discussions with the Abbey Theatre, which we've been doing since the autumn of last year, to address those areas of concern, namely remuneration of artists, employment opportunities, and the, the, the number of, of, of Abbey-owned productions versus uh, co-productions. So that's why we are where we are today. It was in the context of agreeing a new three-year funding um, envelope with the Abbey Theatre and the concerns that we had as we began to engage in that process. But just to say, we have met with the board um, and, and the executive of the Abbey Theatre twice before Christmas. There's further information coming to us for a plenary meeting in two weeks' time, and then the, the group will meet again to, to see what, what progress has been achieved in terms of the areas that we have raised. Well, Margaret, and anybody else? Response. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the uh, the length of the runs and some of the cast. I'd like to pick up on the casting issues as well because I think that's important to be addressed. That um, in terms of the length of the runs of the Abbey shows, they're not dependent on who's directing them. They're dependent on on what the show is and how long one thinks a particular show can sustain. So a show as brilliant as On Raftery's Hill by Marina Carr, which was a really brilliant piece of work but it was not the best attended show of the year by any means. And we ran it for a three week period and it did well, it did really well, it was critically acclaimed. So I want to address also the issue of bums on seats. If you want bums on seats, you wouldn't necessarily program that play and indeed many of the other plays that we program. So we, that is absolutely, we want people to come to the theater, but we program the theater from an artistic imperative. The work has to be brilliant in our view. And a play like On Raftery's Hill, which is, is fantastic and, and, and artistically achieved everything we wanted it to, it's a hard sell, if I'm being really honest. It's a hard sell. And to run that show for a six-week period would not make sense economically, and it wouldn't make sense for the performers to, you know, other than, sure, they would be being paid, which would be fantastic, but they would not be playing to big houses over a six-week run of that show. Some other shows are different, and I don't want to focus in just on one of, of the assistant directors of the Abbey, because there are other directors who are also um, having longer runs on the stage as well. I just want to pick up briefly on, on the casting point. Um, uh, what happened in the casting, that, that there was a head of casting who left in 2017, and in discussion with that person, at that time, we decided we would trial without having an in-house in casting director uh, in discussion with that person, and we, we ceded that to uh, heads of producing, which was, which was a new post, and we also work with freelance casting directors, so they're, you know, who are of the highest standard. So, so I'm going to be specific because, because Declan raised it, so in, in a show like Come On Home, which is directed by a freelance director called Rachel O'Riordan, Rachel worked with a casting director to cast that show. So it isn't just, you know, there is a process that goes on, there is a route through a casting director and through a director to be cast, when, when Gray McLaren casts his shows, he tends to hold very large open workshops for up to 100 people to see for his work, and he narrows it down from there. So there is a process in, in place. I accept, I think it's something that we absolutely need to address, because if, I think if, it, if, if the actors and the casting directors and the agents feel it isn't working, then we need to look at it, and we will look at it. Um, May I? Very briefly, thank you very much. Um, I, when I talk about a casting problem, I'm not necessarily speaking about it for myself. I've been working for about 30 years, and you know, I, I don't need a casting department as much in the theatre in Ireland. The reason I bring it up is because in our meeting of last week, we had there were a number of young actors who just come out of drama school who were very vocal about the fact that they have no connection to the National Theatre. They have no access. A casting department, a, a permanent casting department, mm -hmm. would, you would have a, a, a person whose job it would be to go to small fringe shows in the city, to see people starting out, see people in pub theatres, see people doing wherever they are doing it, and build relationships with those people and bring them into audition and recognise them and nurture their talent over time. An independent casting director can't do that. They've got a gig. They've got lots of other gigs on at the same time. They're doing a telly and a film. They're going to go, OK, we've got the Abbey play, knock that out. We've got to do all these other jobs at the same time. It's not the same thing. It doesn't nurture young talent. And I think it, there's a real... When I heard those young actors discuss this in that meeting, that we had, 
it was genuinely sort of heartbroken for them because they felt they were absolutely, they felt that they had no opportunity mm -hmm. at all. That to, to line given by one said we have two options and it's either to give up or to leave. Yeah. And it was really stark leave the and upsetting. Or, the, or leave the profession rather. Chair, I mentioned in, in while I was speaking the fact that the Abbey is open to listening about the various different issues that have arisen. I have actually, and I know these, these things are, are in different places, I, uh, I'm very aware of what the issue is for freelancers of my children and their generation uh, and their in-laws. I have, I have five freelancers and one person in paid employment, so I know exactly how difficult this is. But I have also met young actors who said to me, I was out of favour with the person at the Abbey, so I never got the gig. Mm -hmm. So there is some blend and some solution here to be found that makes sense in terms of, as you say, having the point in contact, you know, and, and making sure that what we put in place is, is fair across the board. Because obviously, if we, if we at the moment, we, we're drawing on, on, on casting directors and there's, there's a, a problem being identified, and I accept that that's something we need to address. But I would also caution a concern that, that if, if for some actors this is, a, is something which could limit their potential in the future. So it doesn't all go in one particular direction. And it's like the fact that some of our shows have been longer and some have short, been shorter. Some, some actors have gained and some actors have lost in the process of that. But these are all things that we're very happy to discuss in a very open dialogue way with the, with the, with the, with the uh, signatories of the letters and their representatives. The key point for me is though, I think it's very important and this committee I think needs to, 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 will appreciate it, I think the members of it will appreciate it. There are some issues which you mentioned at the very beginning, um, uh, Senator, that, that are, are to do with the industry, the sector, the, the payment, the difficulty of actually surviving as a freelancer in Ireland doing anything, or indeed possibly as, as, as other professions as well. So some of those are, are, are wider ones which we would need to take at a more sectoral level. What we're committed to doing is dealing with those ones which are Abbey specific. But I would say that, that, that the, the background for all of this is a very difficult context for freelancers, people who came out uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the recession who either had to emigrate or couldn't stay here to get work or have got limited work. So I would just urge that, that when we have the discussion, we have this open dialogue which sort of maps out what the different issues are, where they sit, and who might have a role to play in progressing that forward in a positive direction. What I would say is that what happens with the Abbey has an effect on the industry as a whole. Could I, could I say, Jack, back to you? Absolutely. And, and, and we've had exactly that discussion with the, with the Arts Council. How do you measure the ripple effect? And there's a positive ripple effect, and there's a, a, a potentially a downside ripple effect. There's, there's con conflict predicting ones. I'm an economist by background, so I know just how difficult it is. And the Arts Council has been really working very hard to build its evidence base to try to make its decisions. And I respect that entirely. And one of the things that we've been doing over the last year is finding our ways of actually um, providing for them what is needed to allow them to uh, make good decisions in relation to, to, to the, the, the interactions that we have with them. So I, I just as I say, to me there's a, there's a big issue which needs to get into the wider sector, but we will start with looking at those issues which are Abbey specific and which have a, have a bearing on this. Thank you. There's a question asked also about the cost, I don't know whether it was in this round or earlier, cost of the Bonner Kleine side. I don't, report. Have, I don't have that to hand. Yeah, just if you can yeah, for, for, forward that yeah, on to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I have a number of questions myself. Um, uh, I don't know whether anybody else wants to come back in before I ask. Um, so I'll ask uh, Deputy Boy Barish kind of first and then I'll, I'll finish off at that stage. Uh, first of all, let me apologise for not being here earlier, as uh, <laughs> Deputy O'Donnell was kind enough to point out, I wasn't here, uh, nor am I a member of the committee, so thanks, uh, Chair, although I do pop in here uh, as much as I can. Um, uh, uh, and I was at the picket lines all morning for the nurses, so uh, that's why I was late. Uh, and if I'm going over ground that's already been covered, uh, apologies. Um, I mean, when I read the letter, uh, from the signatories, I was both delighted at one level that what is going, you know, that the theatre was being discussed uh, at a national level and mm. that, uh, you know, everything about it was open for discussion. To me, that's just a good thing for a start. Whatever view you may think about, you know, the, the different sides are and angles of the of the debate um, and I was also delighted that the issue of the the precarious situation 
that theatre uh, actors, performers and uh, theatre makers uh, that they have to exist in was being highlighted. Um, because to me, that's something we should all be able to unite I I about I as a, a matter of serious concern, that it's a big problem. And um, I was sad because I thought it's like different parts of the theatre community are having a crack at each other and I'd like to see them kind of unite around addressing these very serious concerns for the people who make theatre if they just can't survive, if they need work coming into Christmas and they don't have it because we've brought in a presented production, is that, I don't even know all the terminology of presented productions uh, and so people don't have work coming into Christmas. Uh, and that they are generally in a precarious uh, situation. Um, and one thing just I'd like you to comment in this regard, because like to me, I just see this as a, the drift over probably decades towards a sort of neoliberal model for the arts, uh, going from a situation where people had, uh, you know, you had theatre companies, you had uh, some sort of security, you had training in-house mm -hmm. uh, to uh, a situation where it's completely precarious. Um, and I just would like everybody to comment on what they think about this because uh, and we've had a similar debate about the film industry, right? And you have one side of the debate that says that's just the way it is. That, you know, it's totally nonsense to imagine we could go back to a time when there was security of employment for people in the arts or film or theatre. That's pie in the sky. Now, I don't frankly agree with that, but a lot of people seem to think that's just the way it is now. Uh, so I'd kind of like people to comment on that. And I'd particularly like to, co uh, to comment uh, in light of a conversation I had with a friend who's a, an opera singer um, who got a job in a theatre in Germany last year. And she was amazed at her experience there, and I was quite amazed to hear it, because it contrasts so starkly with the sentiments that was expressed by the signatories about their situation, and indeed the theatre performers and so on who had a meeting over in Capel Street before Christmas and came in here uh, last week. I mean, it, it, the contrast was so stark, right? Because they just said, we're in a totally precarious situation, we're at the top of our game and we can't pay the rent, we don't know if we'll have work next week uh, or whatever, and frankly, you know, we need to get out of this country or drop out of uh, what we're doing. And then I talked to my friend who's just got a job uh, uh, as uh, an opera singer in a theatre that does everything. It does opera, it does, um, it does theatre, it, they, they, and she said, it's amazing. I get six weeks holidays, I get sick pay, I get holiday pay, uh, I have security of employment. If I'm there for longer than, I think it was a year or two, I'll, I'll basically have a job for life if I want it. I have pension, I have the whole lot, right? Uh, and I just think, wow, right? Can we have that? Uh, shouldn't we have that? And, you know, is the, is the kind of battle that's going on here with the different sides because we've kind of accepted that's impossible and then we end up fighting over the crumbs? Uh, so, you know, the crumbs being who gets on the Abbey stage because, as some of the actors and performers said to me at the Cable Street thing, the smaller companies, they described it in these terms, have effectively been dismantled because of the cuts. That's the way they put it. They've been effectively dismantled. <coughs> where they had some security with the smaller uh, theatre companies in the past, that's gone now, no security at all, and then you're left in a scramble for who gets onto the Abbey stage. Um, and I just think, shouldn't we all unite to say this isn't a good situation? Uh, that the levels of, of public support for the arts in this country are pathetic? Oh, no. uh, we've accepted a situation, uh, I mean public funding support, sorry, the, you know, the percentage of, GD, of, of GDP that goes into the arts is pathetic. Uh, unless we address that, we are going to end up scrambling over the crumbs and that there's an aspect of that uh, in this whole debate. So that's my kind of comment. Thank you. <laughs> we'll start from the, the, the funding. <laughs> um. 
I'm coming to the end of my period as chairperson of the Abbey. Or sorry, of the Abbey. Oh yeah, very that is, good. That is really yeah. bad. I don't know, is that promotion or not? <laughs> I'm not taking that job. <laughs> You're taking that job. <laughs> oh, no, no. Um, of the Arts Council. So I'd like to sort of say this as a valedictory statement that we desperately need you politicians to support us, to speak up for us, to unite in Dáil, in Shannon, everywhere. And not to just do it once a year when it's, it's a budget time, but to do it on a continuous basis. Because, you know, when you speak up for the arts in Ireland, you end up being quite isolated. Don't leave us isolated. Join with us um, in, in making these arguments. There we are. <laughs> Sign the letter. Well, I think, sorry, to the chair. I and I don't want your job, Francis. I think what, what um, the chair of the Arts Council has said is so true. It's, somebody said to me, don't go on the Arts Committee, the Arts and Culture, the Culture and Heritage Committee. There's no votes. I'll, As we're, we're going down the corridor. No, but it's important because I think I'm, it is the I'm rule. Not sorry, not I'm so, sorry, 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 beg your pardon, chair. But, but I, I think it, what you say it is, is important, completely but correct. We, 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 we might prove you wrong. Because the art, artist, but we'll come down through and kind of I'm letting everybody answer. Sorry, Chair, my so, apologies. Sir. Are you finished? Or, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else wants to respond to some? I mean, I, I, I think the, I think the uh, would be in, in, in agreement with the, the key to this issue is the funding levels that are there, and and obviously what was in place before the crash, as in a lot of other sectors, not just this sector, but some of the structures that were in place, which gave people, if not security, they gave them more certainty. And that reduced certainty has obviously exacerbated this, the, the situation. I think what, what is crucial is, is, is funding lines that are more solid, more sustained. And I mean, maybe I'm, 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 I'm an optimist on this, but I mean, the government has very publicly committed to increasing over a period of 10 years the money for the arts. Uh, I, I think just even doing that, I think, was a very positive thing. I think we want to watch, and I think it's important for the people in this room to watch that that money keeps coming through. Uh, I think it needs to be then spent judiciously right across the art system. But I think what this has done is given some focus to the fact that the, 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 you know, the background to this is giving some greater level of, of certainty of opportunities for people that are in the whole system. I mean, the Abbey is one stage. It had, it had a, um, you know, approximately 200 people on the main Abbey stage last year in different shapes and forms. Um, and, and of those, yes, a small number, 45, were involved just in, 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 in direct productions, but there were another 100, 100 plus involved in, in, in other ways and other activities on the main Abbey stage. But still, as a proportion of the total country, that's very small. And I agree with, with, with Senator Warfield that you know, it, is, it, it has a ripple effect that's big, but the other ripple effects of some of the other theatres are also, are also out there as well. So it seems to me that funding is the absolute key and, and funding done in a systematic increasing way, which means that if, if somebody invests in their, in their group, whether it's a small company coming together, and I think there's a lot to be said for small companies coming together, but I'm an economist and we believe in small and medium enterprises as real engines of, it, engines of innovation and, and things that are happening. So I'm, 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 I'm very strong on that. So I would like to see uh, it, 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 the funding coming in such a way that people could begin to think about the next two to three years in their, in their lives as something they can plan to be creative in. And I think that will only come from a greater security of funding in the system. Thank you. Just follow up really yeah, quickly. Yeah. Um, the, the genuine wish from Graham and I when we, when we came to the Abbey was, that, was to make the Abbey, we, what we want to do, and this is still our aim, and, and we still believe it's achievable, is, is to make the Abbey a home for, for artists from across Ireland, whether, whether they're, they're individual freelance artists and performers, or whether there's, there's smaller companies as well. What we, what we felt we could do and what we feel we can do because of the funding we receive is that we can, we can add value to for what the Abbey has and enhance what, what, what is, is a real struggle. And we absolutely accept that struggle and we want to be part of, of, the, of the solution to that. And that we really believe that this is a time for unity and clarity and that the Abbey has a significant part to play in that. And we are really open to that discussion. Thank you. I know Clean was eager to get in, and I think Declan also, so whichever he is, or both. Thank you. Well, I completely agree with Deputy Boy Barrett about, and it's not the Abbey's fault that the arts is underfunded. You know, it's got a specific budget, and we can't expect the Abbey to solve all the problems in the theatre community. But, I mean, I think it is important for politicians to remember that the, the soft power that the arts have in this country, the reputational power 
I mean, Ireland is known around the world for, for its theatre, for its arts. People come to this country, they go to see theatre. They come often specifically to do that. So I think it is a difficult to be working in the arts and to be aware that that is the reputation that it has internationally and yet be living on the breadline at home. And that's a situation that has existed for a very long time and I think it needs coordinated increases in Arts Council funding so that we will not be having disagreements amongst ourselves within the artistic community, but we'll be getting together to lobby governments for more funding, for more respect for the arts as well. Um, and just in terms of the Abbey, I, I think we just need to mention playwrights briefly before we finish because the Abbey historically has been, has a canon of work that has been produced by some of the greatest playwrights, world renowned playwrights. Sean O'Casey, most more recently, Tom Murphy and Brian Friel, Thomas Kilroy. We have some really excellent, excellent. And we, and. Marina Carr. And of course, Marina Carr. Together, exactly. Um, but that has to continue. And at the moment, uh, Marco Rowe, for example, we have younger ones as well, but we need. I, I think there's, there's a. There's a, something's happening in that, in that firm. There's a dearth of them coming through. There's a, there's a lack of opportunity for that. I think we need to res have more cognizance of the fact that the Abbey has been a writer's theatre and the spoken word is, is, is very important historically in the Abbey theatre. And I would like to see personally, and this is a separate discussion for a separate time, more plays produced because what we have at the moment are re-adaptations of other works of art. We have adaptations of films, we have adaptations of novels. Plays, playwriting is a very specific skill. Being a dramatist is a very specific skill and a skill that I think we have to nurture if we're going to have great works of, of theatre in, in our canon for the future. Yeah, I just did want to say that it was, it's, it's two separate arguments and actually we have a draft agenda we've sent to the Abbey, we're waiting on, on them to get back um, where, where the last piece is, let's all be on the same side, let's all get together, let's all make uh, the funding increase. Um, it is, it's 0 0.1 in Ireland, uh, to 0 0.6 in Europe, yeah. that's a sixth and we absolutely punch above our weight internationally, imagine what we could do if we were on 0 0.6. I mean, it would be remarkable. And, I, 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 and just the second point of that is the Abbey, we have one national theatre, only one. It's one, it's special. It's, it's one special thing. And it needs to have a remit that, that, um, that takes that into consideration and that, that does represent the entire Ireland, island of Ireland. Um, it's not the remit of all the other theatres who have their own specific remits and are there to produce and to provide for audiences um, around the country. And so I do think that that's a really important part of the conversation is the National Theatre remit and, um, and how special it is to us and how historic it is, as well as being able to show us where we're going forward. Okay. Um, can that, can I just have one Smith. brief supplementary? I'm going to let Sorry, Deputy go on, Smith go on, in, who was here on. earlier. And yeah, no problem. no problem. Uh, folks, I do apologise this place. There's always meetings falling on top of uh, each other. But anyway, I had a few questions, and I hope I'm not duplicating what already has been answered. And if I am, forgive me. Um, Firstly, I would have to agree with you completely, Cleona. I see the Abbey Theatre somewhere extremely special and hugely important to Irish artists and Irish talent coming through, playwrights, actors, designers, you know, and it's the one place I think that should be where you can use your artistic license, that you don't have to worry so much about bums and seats as we all do as artists. It can't be all about that, and I do think that's what's very unique about the Abbey Theatre, that it doesn't become a commercial entity, and I think from the letter that you wrote and you know what I've been listening to over the last couple of weeks and months, that has been a huge concern. Perhaps that has been addressed today. Um, just picking up, Declan, on your presentation here today, and perhaps it has already been answered by the Alley Theatre. And if, if it has, well and good. If it has, I'd like some of your thoughts on it. Uh, the the casting department. Um, That's okay. Good answer. okay. The dismantling of the uh, literary department. I'm very happy to answer that. Okay. And just um, if you could give us in terms of figures what the number of in-house productions has been, just take last year as an example, as opposed to buy-ins, 
um, or co-production. Co um, co okay. Um, in terms of the dismantling of the literary department, it hasn't been dismantled. It's, we have a new work department, which has a dramaturg who was appointed at the end of 2018, uh, called Louis Stevens, uh, who was a full-time dramaturg here from the Royal Court Theatre in London and a trained at Trinity uh, here in Dublin. Um, so there is a literary department in full action. And I mean, to pick up on Declan's point just now in terms of new plays at the Abbey, you know, in 2019 there are two new plays by new Irish writers on the Abbey stage. So there is a literary department which is functioning. Uh, Dylan Coburn Gray, City Song, uh, Lisa T and Keogh's Beautiful Village are both new plays. They're not adaptations, they're not musicals, they're not film adaptations, they are plays. So, so we, are, we are commissioning and developing new plays throughout. In addition to, uh, to Louise, we have four associate playwrights uh, from, from within Ireland. So there is a really big, I think new, actually, in, if anything, increased function within a literary department. So I hope people will start to see the results of that coming through. Uh, well, they're coming through already. And as I say, there are three new plays. I, I didn't include Dermot Bolger's new play because he's kind of more of a veteran. But uh, the, the other two uh, will be Abbey debutants on the, on the main stage of the Abbey. So there is new work coming through, which we're really proud of and we're really excited to, to put forward. Um, in terms of your question was how many self-produced shows in, uh, I think we've... Proportionally. We've, well, we've, we've acknowledged it, that, that it was less in 17 and 18. It reduced to four on the main stage. As opposed to... It was been six the year before, six from 2016. As opposed think, to, though, the, the, the buy-in, the more commercial side well, of things? Well, we don't... I don't use the word buy-in. The, the buy-in is not <coughs> what we use. It's invited. It's invited and it's, and, and it's curated. It's part of the programme. Um, and... It's, but they're not in-house productions. Not, no, not strictly in-house. No, there's, there's, a, there's a range of production. There's in-house that is co-produced, and there are very few. This year, there's only five weeks of the year is given over to what we would call invited productions. Okay, so can you give me some idea in terms of figures? Yeah. You're buying productions and, 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 as opposed to your in-house productions. Well, could, Deputy, could I just come in on this? In, in the pack that was distributed, just David's data and information, but on the main Abbey stage, I mean, traditionally it's been six or seven shows a year. It's back up to that this year with having had two low years of four. So there's definitely, we're, we put our hands up and say very directly, we did not uh, do the, the usual traditional that number. That has really been what has caused this frustration among yes, the actors. Uh, so, and so there's a sense in which this problem was already in train to be solved and our discussions with the Arts Council had reflected some of the discussions in relation to that. So let's be you know, very clear. If, if, if the letter had come as a letter to, to, the, to the Abbey as opposed to the Minister, we would have had a lot of clarifications to what's going on and then we would be down to the issues that are still outstanding and are more complex. But, but just to let you know, it's, 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 it's seven shows for this year on the main Abbey stage. We're going to have... Self-produced. Self-produced. We're going to have four co-produced shows. Uh, there will be two ones done in association, which there's again, the glossary is in the, is in, in the piece. We'll all know very much more about how theatres are produced than we've ever known before. Okay. Uh, and there's two presented. So the vast majority, both in terms of time, of resources, uh, of programs, is basically on, on self-produced and with, with some on co-produced. So just to let you know, that, that, in other words, this, this concern, which... which so I, there was I, a problem, it's acknowledged now and been rectified. There was, there was an adjustment pattern which the board decided in line with the directors that we would do a mixed production model in any case. And going right back to, the, to, to 2013, I mean, the Abbey has always had... In 2015, it had four presented shows. It had two co-produced shows. So this is not anything new. The balance, yes, over those two years of adjustment was greater than... Uh, probably than we would, would, have, would all have wanted to have, but we're not changing. The model of mixing is, we think, that is the right one. The balance within that mixing, and I think the Arts Council used the word balance, the balance is what we're talking about here. But we're not talking about something that's, that's hugely, hugely, hugely different. And as I say, it was already the case that seven main stage Abbey shows were, 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 were patterned in for 2019. And that goes back to earlier last September, I think, when that decision was made. Okay. Can I just pick up on, on, on another... Um aspect of Declan's presentation. Declan, you might just remind me because I don't want to read through the whole thing again, but in terms of going back to the literary department, and I know, Neil, I accept you say there is one there. However, Declan presented some, I think, factual-based evidence in terms of playwrights submitting work and not getting that response or not getting that communication. Well, there are two things. One, there is a distinct lack of response and communication, and this, we've heard this start from a number of people at the meetings that we've had. The second thing which I find strange is in this new works department, 
established writers who should be who have a relationship with the Abbey Theatre have to send in work anonymously. They're treated the same as anybody who's so there's no names on some of the scripts. So you're sending in stuff. How do you build a relationship? with a writer who has a, a history and a relationship with the theatre, if everybody now in this works department is just sending in works anonymously. I, I, I don't, I, that doesn't sound like nurturing to me. And I think you need a, a, a literary department that works with the young playwright over the course of the development of the play. Okay. That, that Can I put a question to Declan? The I literary, the literary um, part... I want Na Neil just to respond to that. Just respond well, to also, today, just I mean. to rebut the, some of these issues. There is two sides, hopefully Absolutely. on Friday, kind of some of them will be issued, kind of, the, the, um, and kind of we, we, we would hope that when, when it's all sorted, you will come back to us with a wish list that we will hopefully be able to uh, follow up on. And if they're not sorted, that you'll also come back to us. Um, I'm not cutting off debate, I, I will come back to you in a sec. Go, go ahead, one more question. Yeah, well, it's just... Oh, sorry, I've Neil, lot, I'd ask Neil listen, to, ask, just and I'm ask Neil no, to respond. I'm, I'm still talking about the same thing, don't worry, Neil. Right. Just, I've heard a lot of the discussion and debate around that, and it's an area I just feel passionate about myself, because I think that's where it's all coming from, or not, depending on the case, in terms of our future for, for, for theatre. Um, but for, we'll say, playwrights who are using that facility for this Declan, what was the experience as a literary department as opposed to what it is now? Uh, I'm not the best person to answer that simply because I'm not a writer. So I think, you, you know, you really need to have a playwright to be specific. Have the, you the heard information, the experience of others, well, we, we, In the meeting we had last week, uh, the Writers Guild. Yeah. Uh, this is where we're getting this information from, from members of the Writers Guild. Yeah. And uh, as I said in the submission, the Writers Guild requested information about commissioned work from the Abbey Theatre, how many plays have been commissioned for 2019 going forward, and we still haven't received that information for this presentation. We didn't get an answer to that question. So, you know, it sounds, everything sounds good and well, but in reality it's not quite the same as it sounds. Not the experience for the, those trying to, to get in. So, Neil, you might respond to yes. that then. So, in, in terms of uh, Declan's point about established writers, that is a very clear channel, both directly to the dramaturg or to the directors of the Abbey and we have regular meetings with experienced playwrights <coughs> in their work, then they don't have to submit anonymously. That, you know, th there is that process, but there's a direct line, and we meet regularly with those writers and, and are working on shows with those writers as well. So that, that's the fact of that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the issue around the, the writers' skills, because what, what we've said consistently since January the 7th is that we want to talk to the signatories. And that's what we've been, you know, this, this has come ahead of that and we welcome it. Um, there will be a, a whole raft of information to go to, to, to the Writers Guild, but we wanted to have one line of communication. Otherwise, uh, there was a real sense of fragmentation to fly out. But the, the reality of the literary department is that we are commissioning more work, and as I say, we have, there are three new plays on the Abbey stage this year, two by new writers who are making their debuts on the Abbey stage, Irish writers. So that, that's a fact. That's, you know, the, that's a manifestation of what, of what we are doing. We accept this taking time for people to get it, to, to perhaps, for, for the structure to get in place. I believe it is now in place with the appointment of a full-time dramaturg and with significant support for that person. So we're really optimistic moving forward that not only will we be working with the great established playwrights of Ireland, who we absolutely want to be working with, but we're also opening up channels for emerging writers to have a real career path in Irish theatre. Can I just come in on that? Just yeah, clearly. Sorry. Just in terms of communication issues, I, I, I genuinely think that highlights that a little. 409 people signed this letter. They signed it as individuals. They didn't sign it as organisations. Um, and organisations should be able to go to the National Theatre, ask for numbers, and get them very quickly for whatever presentation or reason that they want. It should be freedom of information. It should be there. Two days ago, I asked the Royal Court for their figures. I asked the National uh, for their figures. And I got figures from a French company. And they gave them to me within 24 hours. And I kind of just think that, that there needs to be further work done on communications. I, I would accept that. I mean, in, in, in a normal circumstances, we would simply provide that information. However, given the heat around the whole, the whole upcoming meeting, we felt it was better to focus everything on, on the process with the signatories, which, and, and there have been various, various side issues to that, but we want to wrap them all together. In future, we will absolutely communicate clearly. Well, I just think it's unusual to withhold numbers from, from somebody in, well, in, we did, we did, in, in order to give them to another group. 
Can I just, 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 say, just say, Chairman, something back that you said at the beginning. I think what's really important now is to get into a space with a good dialogue where we see exactly what's, what's happening. There's been a lot of change going on, and anybody who's had the experience of being through change management knows that things don't always get communicated as clearly as they should. Not everybody is affected equally positively by the change, and this has been a very significant change. I would just want to say on behalf of the Board that we are absolutely committed to having stronger communication with the whole of the sector. I think there's been parts of the sector we've had very strong communication with, but it's not been even. And I think, the, I think it's absolutely the board's view that that communication system must be in place. When you're making changes, you're setting up new departments, you're hiring people, so you've got the department there, somebody maybe has gone. It's, there's, there's a time which basically needs to be taken until somebody is in place. I think we're now very much in place with the people that, that you and Graham have hired uh, in terms of the new works department, in terms of, of, of the dramaturg, in terms of other people who've come into the, in, into the theatre since, since in, the, in the last just of 18 months. So I think I would, like to, I would like to hope that if we were having this conversation in six months' time, we'd all be in a very much, much, much better place, much wider understanding of what the issues are, and a shared information base that means that we're all speaking to exactly the same numbers, understanding them in exactly the same, the same kind of way. If it's going to take a little bit of time, my own belief is that, that there's a whole range of questions, but I think it is correct to, and this has been the Abbey's approach, let's bring them together as a system rather than deal with one issue there, one issue there. And then the danger with a single set of issues is that you end up with other unintended consequences. Because nobody ever intended the consequences that have arisen or have been seen to be arisen with regard to the change model. So I think it's important that if we take the whole system together, we work with the sector, and then we work subsequently in a wider way for those issues that go well beyond the Abbey. I think that's what we should be planning to do. And one final question. How are the Abbey Theatre communicating with all of those signatories on that letter going forward? A, 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 the, the, the signatories have now nominated uh, contact points and basically our meeting is set up for this, this Friday, a first meeting. It will have to be very much a scoping meeting because the scale of this is very significant and it's become wider as the debate, uh, I mean I think uh, Deputy Barrett made the point that one of the very positive things here is that it has widened the debate on theatre. So it seems to me that we want, we want to scope that whole thing together. They've looked for represent, represent, representatives from across the sector so that they're not under-representing any group. We want to have this preliminary meeting to see how do we take this forward. It's literally like a big, a big structure, not structure, but it's a schedule of meetings to be put in basically. How do we do those very different things? What pieces of information do we need to know? What information do we need to gather? Do we have, what do we have already? What do we not have? And effectively develop it from that There that is a schedule of meetings planned out to communicate. We would, no, we've, we've, we're basically, we're having the first meeting, and at that, the usual way with these kind of processes is you get together in a room, you have an initial discussion presentation to share ideas and share views, and then you determine the schedule of meeting. It's like the planning of any implementation process, and we're all committed so to on to Friday, we won't know, and you've had that sort of scoping meeting and everything as to what the plan will be going forward oh, until after that. I mean, Friday is just going to be. Uh, in order to schedule further meetings because unfortunately Mr McLaren isn't available and I think a lot of the board aren't available in terms of the Friday meeting so I think Friday will just be uh, outlining the scope and then planning the further meetings where everyone is available. I think, I think maybe that's a misunderstanding in certain cases what, we've, what we're hoping for on Friday is that we will and obviously Declan's paper today does some of it but that we'll actually get a succinct view from the Abbey's perspective, because I think you asked to make presentations from the different groups that we'd actually hear what that was, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in that context, see where the bits fit together. Because it's not, it's, it's, it, there's a preliminary set of, of pieces to be done before we can actually get into detailed discussions. For example, one of the things that came up earlier on was the, the contracts for people who are, who are, who are in uh, presentations on the, in the Abbey, because there's legal issues there that need to be teased out and worked, worked through. So it's, there's a whole set of things, but by the end of Friday's meeting, I think we'll have a very good plan of action to see how we take each of those in turn and move forward on them. So just to clarify, um, Francis, who was going to this meeting on Friday on the Abbey Theatre side? I'm the, as chair of the Abbey, I'm going on, on, on Friday. Sarah Durkin, who's one of the directors, is going on Friday. And Neil Murray is going on Friday. And we've done that because uh, in terms of getting, getting a first meeting going, we think that's the most productive way. We have a, a, a relatively small board, many of whom don't live in Dublin, who, who we can't have along on a Friday evening for that purpose. So we thought with respect to everybody to give those directors time to see at what point they would engage and which parts of this discussion it would be most appropriate for them to engage with. So it's in no way, and maybe incorrectly, uh, maybe just at the, the created, but I, there's no disrespect at all to the group that we're actually sending along the chair 
with Sarah Durkin and with the director. Neil Graham is, 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 is in, in, out of Ireland on Friday and cannot be there. So, so, it's, so that's just to be clear, is. sorry, the original invitation was for meeting on Friday morning when Graham would have been available, yeah. but he had an international uh, commitment on Friday evening. So that's why it's a smaller group on the Friday evening from the Abbey. Okay. The original just invitation. Very short, very short. Right? First thing is, could. Um, Declan and Fiona, did you, can you just, did you get a, 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 a good response from the public? Did you feel that the public were behind you? I mean, we read the letters, obviously, we were informed by, we might have been informed in a different way here, through the Irish Times and through the media. Did you, did you feel the public were behind you? Did you get that sense of a wave? Well, I think it's, I think it's, it's complicated in that whenever I heard any of the radio interviews, I suppose it's the nature of radio, you're trying to sort of create uh, drama. But every time actors are referred to, they're referred to as lovies. Mm. And it's an extraordinary thing. I mean, I think I'd be interested to ask some of these. So it's hard to gauge what the public's view is when you have the presenter basically saying, and these lovies, what do you make of these lovies? Mm. Um, the idea that if you ask that presenter if he was living on the kind of money that we're living on with no tenure of employment, no health mm. insurance, never knowing where your next job is coming from, and you're going to have to do basically another job interview every time you want to work, I think he would be calling on something else, and I don't think he'd be able for it, whoever, he or she. So the perception of the acting community is also something from England in the 1950s. You know, it's Laurence Olivier and John Gilgut, it's nonsense. Mm. So it's very hard to gauge, sorry to answer your point along with the, 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 the actual public's reaction to it. I just wanted, Chair, and I'll finish on this. That's the second question. Uh, yeah, I, no, it's not a question, it's an observation. I wanted to say that I and congratulate you there, Neil, in another way, because it would be Philistines I hang out with who would never have crossed the Abbey door, who have been to the Abbey because of the productions that have been on and loved it, you know. Um, so it's very important to be say something. We're not here to judge, you know, that there's a positive nature of it. Also, I think you're up against, if you look at Breaking Bad, it's theatre on television, you know, it's, um, you're up, the, the, the forces against live theatre are so enormous, with net, starting with Netflix and moving down to your telephone, you know, and it's so theatrical, um, it's very clever that you feel you're in the room somewhere, that you're nearly at the theatre you know, it, through some of these films. And uh, so it's a huge challenge. And uh, the Taoiseach has promised that he would double arts funding. He said that um, uh, six months ago. I mean, it was a double or treble. I better start on double, on double, on double your money. <laughs> you think <laughs> Whatever it was, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Whatever it was, it wasn't overnight. I can no, I'm job. kidding, I'm kidding. I mean, but he did say it because he, to be very genuine, I, I used to meet him quite a lot out of the theatre before he became a teacher control. He was very genuine interested in the arts. Me, I think there are heartbeats and without them we are less human beings both educationally and performance-wise and observationally. So I think there is a huge, there has to be a huge surge against this and against everything to actually make, make the arts central. And I think that the funding is extraordinarily important here so that you, this doesn't happen to you. You know that you I think have we'll ways have that. That's another and topic. roots. Yeah. How, That's how, another speech. Yeah. Another, another speech Sorry, and another topic Chair, for the but committee. It's very important. How to get rid of the iPhones and whatever not. <laughs> um, I have a number of questions myself. Um, and one of them is to say the arts matter, which is what, uh, an issue we were debating last week. There are votes in it. Um, and I've argued that the most intense lobby I got from when I got first elected was in 2004, was uh, Section 481, where everybody who seemed to be in the film industry, their brothers, sisters, uncles, their neighbours, wrote individual letters to me and I presume to ev every other TD, um, appealing for the protection of the, the, the Section 481, which is a tax incentive for the film industry. So that was one experience I had in terms of votes. Uh, the other one was in the 2011 election, I think it was, in my own constituency, 400 artists uh, wrote to me asking me to sign up to a pledge, invited me to a meeting which had, I think it was 300 people or 400 people in the Projects Arts Centre uh, at the time. So sometimes we forget there is a, a, a vote out there. Uh, the people we are talking about are in front of you. They're normal people. They live with us. They kind of go to school, kind of wish our brothers, sisters, their kids go, and they have the same needs as we have. They have to eat. They have to clothe themselves, and they have to pay a mortgage. 
Um, so we, we need to remember that. There are a number of issues that I just listening, um, and if, if they're not appropriate to be answered here, um, then I'd, I'd urge us to bring them into that debate on Friday. Um, there is a question which is in some ways for the Arts Council to look at is in terms of a, a, a mention of double funding, so theatres uh, getting funding and then getting funding again because they're in the Abbey with a production. And it, it, it's something that maybe the Abbey have to take funding away from any theatre, God forbid, it's to ensure that uh, uh, we, we don't end up with, with a situation where um, it's detrimental to the National Theatre at, at the very least. Um, in terms of the, the participants or the practitioners or what do you call a group of actors, playwrights, whatever else, there's so many different troubadours. skills, troubadours, <laughs> well, very courageous people in, in fairness to them. And, uh, is these issues have that, that kind of, I presume, emerged in frustration um, in the letter. You know, had they been raised before? Had there been consultation during the, the report that, we, that was mentioned earlier on in 2013? Was, was it... Uh, 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 it was, was that the reason why it was triggered? Um, or was it, just a, a, was it a lack of di dialogue or miscommunications? Or, or, um, that? In, in terms of the, the, those in the Abbey, and, and it also has to do with the Art Council, I, I, in the presentation it was mentioned that funding off late has been on a year-to-year -year basis, whereas before it seemed to be on a three-year basis. Um, and is that a frustration or a difficulty for the Abbey in planning? Uh, because usually multi-annual funding is a lot easier for planning, especially if you're planning three or four years down, down, down the road. And some of what I've heard today, if if it's to be implemented or if to, to roll back on some of the, the, the changes that have happened, if that's what's required, would require some type of certainty in terms of funding. Uh, and I agree with those who mentioned the minuscule funding that the arts, arts get. Um, in terms of two issues, um, I'm not going to name names or, or, or that, um, but there's quite a number of staff in the Abbey have left in recent times. Um, some who have kind of very, it's very important positions, or I would presume that they're important positions or prominent positions in Irish theatre. And they seem to have left at a time when they're probably most needed. Um, and is there a concern in the board for that level of uh, staff leaving? I think. The figures I had is up to 30 in the last two years. I don't know whether uh, that um, HR staff, uh, heads of different uh, sections, um, that'd be one. The other one is more concerning. So I'll read out the, the end part first, um, and it's to, uh, to get an assurance kind of publicly here, uh, but then also to deal with it uh, through Friday is that none of the signatories, because there is a concern among some of the signatories, because they've contacted me individuals, that they will um, be blacklisted or sidelined having signed the letter. Um, and that this has been overheard um, by some of the cast in one of the, the plays um, that kind of the signatories will be uh, got. So it, it, it's just, people say things in heat, mm -hmm. I've been there, done that, and regretted some comments I've made. It's to make sure that nobody in the industry feels under pressure, and uh, there's a job of work to be done, and I, I severely or sincerely wish you as well in the work that you're starting to undertake in, on Friday, uh, just to deal with the Abbey, but I, I know from having discussed this since the letter, uh, was published, the huge amount of interest there are amongst other actors who have never had anything to do with the Abbey just because they are looking for guidance, they are looking for hope. Um, so they are the main questions um, and kind of 
the, the other thing is just, I will, I, I'll, I'll allow you to answer and then we'll finish off, but um, genuinely, all of those who have attended this committee mm. in, in recent weeks since I've uh, become chair um, have a genuine interest in the arts and uh, they don't want it to be fractured in any which way. They understand and value it. Um, and, and I can genuinely say on behalf of the committee that if you feel we can be of help mm -hmm. in any way, uh, drop us a line, kind of pick up the phone, and we will try and help and facilitate. Um, so uh, uh, if, if people can answer those questions. So I, the first one I asked was off the Abbey, or sorry, off the Arts Council. Thank you, uh, Peter Luck. Um, yes, we've been in discussions with the Abbey Theatre over the last number of months and we've been assured now that, and we're agreeing a template, so there'll be an MOU um, for each of the co-productions that are on the stage of the Abbey or the work that's in association. So it's very clear that we can see that there's absolutely no duplication of funding in terms of activities that may have been supported by the Arts Council in other ways. In relation to um, three-year funding, we would have liked back in 2017 to have offered the Abbey a three-year funding commitment for 18, 19 and 20, but we didn't feel we could at that stage that we didn't have information available to us in terms of the artistic vision and the overall strategy for the next number of years. That has now been provided, so we did offer just one-year funding at that time, but we've now offered a two-year funding envelope, and we would hope that as issues are resolved that, that we will go back to the normal um, rhythm of, of issuing a three-year funding agreement with the Abbey Theatre to allow them um, to plan um, in the most effective way possible. So hopefully that will... Okay, and um, to the Abbey there's two questions. One was, how has that affected just the lack of the three-year funding? And the second one was, um, what, I, what I'd hope is the commitment in relation to the signatories. Could I just, just briefly, and then I pass to Bastini, just to say that from the, the, uh, from the Abbey's point of view, I think, as we all know, in all our hearts, that three-year funding is always better than one-year funding to plan well and to make sure that you can get people, you know, booked on much earlier and get get the, that the program uh, developed. So we're delighted that the Arts Council is 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 trying to to move back to that three-year funding. We weren't ready for them at the particular stage, and they agreed to take one year off at what day one year start, and then to do a two-year arrangement. And that's what we're hoping to complete on, hopefully, in the next in the next number of weeks. But it is it's a really valuable thing. I think that would be uh, would would be something we'd. we'd uh, very much value to getting back into it, because I think that's what the sector really needs in terms of trying to give certainty. It gives more certainty to everybody who's in the industry who you're going to be hiring over that period. Um, the, the other two issues you raised, one was the turnover of staff. Yeah. Um, it's always disappointing when, when brilliant people leave, but in my experience of working in theatre a long time as well, as it's, there's a rhythm that towards people work with certain directors or certain regimes almost, and over, over the first two years of that it starts to change and people start to you know, the wind blows in different directions for people. So we've lost some brilliant people, which I regret, but we've also replaced them with some brilliant people. So I feel like we have a really good, solid team at the Abbey at the moment to move forward. Um, your second point about any, any hint of, of blacklisting is, can I just categorically stamp on that, please? Many of the people who signed that letter are friends. I see all of them as colleagues. I would absolutely refute, and, 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 and in the strongest terms, that will not be the case. Thank you. And that, the final point was the question I'd asked. Uh, <coughs> I presume that it was frustration. You mean communications? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I think since the letter came out, we all individually have been asked this question of why we didn't maybe go and write to the Abbey or why we didn't and why it went to the Minister. Um, uh, and there had been um, formal requests to meet with the Abbey from uh, the ISSSD, who were the Irish uh, Society for Stage and Screen Designers. I think the Writers Guild had got onto them. There was very little response. Um, the ISSSD didn't get a response for five months and still hadn't a meeting planned at that stage. And we just felt that uh, this was now urgent. It was an urgent action needed to be taken. Um, and as the, the status of the, of the Abbey as, the nat as our national theatre, that, that falls under the remit of the department and the minister and the Arts Council. And so that's the action we took, is to inform all of those people about our, our frustrations. It was a cry for help at that stage. Ho hopefully the cry will be heated and that we'll be in a much healthier place. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, it's been a long session in some ways. Um, and I want to again sincerely wish everybody well um, on Friday. Um, the intention is a copy of 
uh, the transcript and also the, 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 the full speeches and the documentation, the slides, will be presented or sent to the Minister, um, just so that she is kept abreast of, kind of our, our discussion. And hopefully uh, the Minister, uh, when she comes here to discuss the estimates in March, that we'll be able to persuade her um, that the estimates are wrong and that maybe kind of she should look again, or at the very least that there be a commitment for increased funding, as uh, has been mentioned from the teacher, that that starts to be front-loaded rather than uh, kind of maybe in two or three years' time, uh, just because the issues that we have dealt with so far, some of them are very specific to funding, and especially uh, for those practitioners who are living on the breadline or barely not surviving, who without them we wouldn't have the joys of theatre in Ireland. So, Arish Kuramogwiv, um, having said that, I will suspend the meet for uh, a number of minutes. I have to go to a uh, private session in a few minutes. Okay. So, we suspend. Thank you. <clears throat>